Um, just to let everybody know, the inspector's just um, having a few technical issues joining, but she will not be long. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My apologies about that. That was not an auspicious start to another week. So uh, can everybody see and hear me now, as I have been now been able to join the meeting? Excellent. Thank you. Um, I have been trying for some time, for some reason. Um, my system went down yesterday, so I don't know if it's linked to that. So my apologies. Um, but I'm here now, so we can make a start. Right. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. The time is now gone, 9.30. So again, my apologies for being late. Um, uh, so I'm going to resume the hearing sessions, which are into the examination of the Stroud District Local Plan Review. Um, and I'm Yvonne Wright, and I'm uh, here today uh, to examine uh, the issues relating to Matter 6. And we're going to be specifically looking at Matter 6A, um, although I will give a little bit of a caveat in a minute um, about that, um, in that a lot of, or some of the questions are related to uh, site allocations. So um, some people may have come along wanting to talk about specific sites. Now, if you're not going to be attending the specific site allocation sessions and you're uh, comments are in relation to the matter 6a questions then I'm happy to discuss those if however you are coming along to the uh, matter 6 actual site allocation sessions then I really would prefer to have those discussions uh, on those questions within those sessions because we have got time allocated to do that um, 
because I don't want repetition. But I recognise that not everybody can come along to every single session that they wish to, uh, that's relevant to their representations that they've made. Um, so I will, obviously, if there is a need to discuss um, some, um, some site allocations, then obviously uh, I will allow that if you definitely cannot come along to the site allocation session, which are uh, the rest of this week and next week. And then I know we need to go back and um, confirm dates for matter five continuation of those discussions. Um, now, before we just do some uh, introductions, and as part of the introductions, then if you can let me know if uh, you cannot attend later site allocation sessions and therefore you would like to discuss particular site allocations in relation to the questions that are in matter 6a not other any other questions um, then obviously uh, I that would be helpful if you could just tell me which of those um, site allocations you are interested in discussing today so I can make a list um, just a reminder that we're not going to be discussing emission sites I know that some representations have included those um, but that's they're just not going to be discussed at all throughout the entire plan so it's just a reminder about that i will be taking uh appropriate breaks this morning um we'll be having lunch continuing this afternoon taking appropriate breaks as and when required um because some of the questions aren't as i said the site allocation uh, are related more to the site allocation sessions which are following on from tomorrow um it could be that Actually, we don't need this afternoon, but let's see how it goes. It's certainly there if we need it. Are there any questions anybody wants to raise? Or is that quite clear at this stage? There's a question. Mr. Partridge. Just get this working. So, yes, thank you, ma'am. Um, it wasn't a question about those matters, it was a question about something else procedurally. Can I ask that now? Yes, of course you can. The council have put out on the website the list of potential main modifications, SLP AD 003. One of the, well, the two main modifications, four and seven, refer to an increase in employment land. Um, which I'm very grateful for, but I couldn't work out how that came about. No, what I've asked the council to do, I haven't actually looked at that list yet. I've asked the council, everything that we get goes onto the mm -hmm. onto the website, okay? Because you know, we don't hold any information that, you, that uh, the public don't see. Um, so what I wanted to do is to, um, because that had been sent to us, I wanted to ensure that it was put out there. Now it is a moving feast. It's very much, it's a document that will constantly change. It will be constantly added to. So um, whether those are, and, and that's why it's called a draft, it should mm, be called yeah, draft yeah, potential yeah. main modification. Because I haven't, my, myself and my colleague haven't agreed to those main modifications no, no. at all. So, exactly where that's come from. I did notice, I did very much skim. I have skimmed most of the documents because obviously it, they can't go on there unless we're content with the documents going on there. Um, but it's something I'm going to be raising as part of the matter eight session, which will be the employment land provision. Sure. Okay, so yeah. um, so I am aware of that because that is okay. certainly a question that I want to ask the council. Okay, I was, I was just cautious that I sort of missed something. And no, no, just... you certainly haven't because <laughs> okay. no, that Thank came as a surprise to me. To be fair, so um, but I'm not going to be raising it now, and yeah, I didn't no, want no. to raise it and have a conversation with the council uh, through the program officer outside of these hearing sessions because that's we don't do that. Um, so I will I will be raising that as part of matter eight. That's, that's so, perfect. But thank you for highlighting it anyway, thank but I was aware. You. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Ms. Smith? Yes, um, because um, a new version of the National Planning Policy Framework came out after the Reg 19, but I think it was before the plan was submitted. Um, some of us are uncertain which version the plan's actually being tested against. I was just wondering if you could let us know. It's always again, I certainly can. It's always the latest version. Okay. So it's the 2021 version. 
Thank you very much. So it's not a get, even if a plan is based on an older version, we, yeah. we assess the consistency against yes. and, and just yes. look against yes. the latest version. Okay. Okay. Yeah. One more question. Do you like us to refer to paragraphs within that policy or do you know it's so inside out, you're kind of happy for us just to assume that, you know, uh, I wouldn't. I would. I don't think any inspector would wish to say that they know. Um, they know it completely inside out. Um, yeah. I don't think anybody does. To be fair. So yes, if there is reference, just re refer to the paragraph. I've got. Okay. Okay. I've got it right in front of me. So okay. please okay. highlight that. I can go straight to it. I will. I may well know which paragraph you're talking about. Okay. But okay. Do that when we come to to the session that you uh, the section that you want to discuss. That would be great. That would be help, very helpful to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Danks, please. Morning, ma'am. Um, sorry to extend this uh, question session. Um, just picking up on what Mr. Partridge said, we are not attending math the matter eight session, but there are things within the proposed modifications that are relevant to us. Um, are you expecting to have a discussion around that document? Um, it we wasn't, this is more of a um, it's more of a discussion with between um, the inspectors and the council in a public setting. Mm -hmm. um, it's a more of a discussion. What I wanted to do was the council to we have said to the council, we've directed the council. Can you have a look at that for us to see? And so we are interested to see what the council comes up with in terms of any particular uh, changes. And um, they also set out in a, a series of statement of common ground and some other responses to representations that have been made that some other uh, modifications would be uh, provided. Now, and I've, just, and I've just said to the council, can you just put those into a draft potential list of modifications? Then they're all in one place and then we can start to have a look at it. Now, where it's relevant to certain sections, um, if we feel that it's necessary for soundness, irrespective of what others think, then obviously we will direct the council to, yes, that must be a main modification. Where we are unsure, we will obviously have that discussion with the council in, in relevant sections. So it doesn't necessarily stop others from contributing to that discussion within those sections. Um, I'm not sure which within those hearing sessions, those hearing sessions that we, that we haven't as yet had yeah um so i'm not sure which areas you're particularly concerned about uh, um, but i haven't looked through every single main modification that right. suggested main modification i should say because these aren't agreed this is these are, this is just council putting forward their wording at yeah. this stage so which ones are you particularly concerned about uh, it would be related to the employment land, so exactly the same as Mr Partridge. Okay, said. so it is in relation it, to that. It's adjacent to our, our client's land. So you're not, so you're not available to do that session. The date we, hasn't been set yet for that session. It's about to be. No, so, we, what we haven't done is we've obviously not made any duly made representations at this stage, because um, obviously they're ah, okay. part of the main modifications process. So if there's a discussion to be had around it, we've not been invited to matter eight at the moment and have not made any representation. Um, so it's really just how we deal. If, if you're going to discuss it, I think we'd probably like to be part of the session. If you're not going to discuss it and it's going to be left to main modifications, then obviously we'll go through the normal process. Um, leave that one with me. I'm gonna to have to have a think about that because I need to be careful. I mean, we can invite whoever we wish to the sessions. Yeah. Um, nobody has a right to be heard unless they've made a representation. Obviously, you're fully aware of that, but we can invite who we wish. So your so your concerns are in relation to, just remind me. So it's the employment land um, at Junction 12. Mum, I don't have it in front of me, so I, I can't give you the reference. That's fine, no, don't worry, don't worry. Let me just make a note. Uh, and, and just for clarity, so our, our client um, has interests at PS30 Huntsgrove and PS32, um, which is the Quedgley East extension, which we're going to discuss, I guess, later on as part of Matter 6, whatever it is, for the site specifics. Okay. 
so it could be raised as part of that potentially yeah yeah i i i'm a flexible mom to, to obviously to suit yourself in the council it's just we don't have duly made objections or, or Let me, um, on that obviously or that document as nobody has at the moment no and this is always the risk of um of getting uh the council to publish all documents but then um there's nothing secretive about this process so it's obviously it brings out questions in people saying well why is that why is the council put that in and why have they done that um we're not sure why so um unless you know until we've asked those questions they've obviously uh it's obviously based on something that's come out of either a statement of common ground or, or something that we've not discussed yet mm -hmm. so um leave that one with me whether we raise it as part of the relevant site allocation section uh when we come to deal with some of the employment sites that may be relevant if not then um i'll because i said you're not aware of, of when matter is going to happen yet it's going to be in Ju late june sometime hopefully uh, we're struggling to get the program sorted at the moment but um i will i'll take on board what you said about whether you should be present at that session okay uh, mum if if it's if it's helpful then um and if if you've got specific questions we'd be happy to obviously produce a an addendum to uh, any statements whether it's matter on the matter six or matter eight um okay thank you okay Mom. okay thank you leave that one with me thank you okay any other queries or questions no okay thank you for that that's been helpful Okay, so can I just go through the list of participants then, please? So that I am clear as to who's present today. Can I start with council, please? Thank you. Good morning, Inspector. Good morning, everybody. Um, Mark Russell, Head of Planning, Strategy and Economic Development at the District Council. And with me to get today are Conrad Moore, Principal Planning Strategy Officer, and Helen Johnston, Senior Planning Strategy Officer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Russell. Uh, the representatives for Avent Homes and Seven Homes, please. Yes, good morning, Mum. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all again. Um, it's Nathan McLaughlin. I'm actually just sitting on behalf of Seven Homes today. Just Seven Homes. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Jones, please. Good morning, all. Good morning, Mum. Um, Hayden Jones, I'm District Councillor for the Barclay Bay Award. My colleague, Lindsay Green, is also down today, I think, but um, she's been held up, so I'll, I'll give her apologies in advance if that's okay. Okay, thank you. And the representatives for Taylor Wimpy and Freeman Homes, please. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, everybody. Connor Flanagan from Black Box Planning. Thank you. Gloucestershire County Council. Morning, ma'am. Morning, everyone. It's Nathan Drover, Highways Development Manager at Gloucestershire County Council. I've got um, Louisa Sam Taywood and Claudia Curry. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, representatives for Ecotricity, please. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, ma'am. It's Paul Fong from Morgan Elliott Planning, representing Ecotricity. Thank you. Representatives for Alexandra Orchard, please. Is Zesta planning here? No. Okay. Uh, for Simmon yeah. Homes. Oh, sorry. Was that a. <laughs> no, I said I'd, I'll check. With oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, for Simmon Homes, Seven Valley, please. Good morning. James Billard, Blue Fox planning, representing for Simmon Homes. Thank you. Barclay and Sharpness Residence Action Group, please. No. Again, Ms. Glancy. Sorry, my 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 mute's taking a long time to unmute. That's okay. Um, don't worry. I'll check. I'll check with them. Yeah, I thought they were coming. Okay, in. that's fine. Thank you. Um, I've got um. 
a large number of names, so I'm not quite sure who is present in the meeting for uh, Minchin Hampton Parish Council and Local Plan Response Group. Morning. Ah, okay. good, good morning, ma'am. Sorry. Um, uh, Nick Hurst, chair, chair of Minchin Hampton Parish Council and Australia District Council Ward Councillor. Thank you. Is there anybody else present then for Minchin Hampton? Um, yes. Yeah, sorry. Oh. I'm uh, Pippa Schwartz. Um, I'm here representing CPRE, but I'm also Minchin Hampton Parish Councillor and Vice Chair of the Minchin Hampton Robert Commons Advisory Committee. Lovely. Thank you. And I've got three other names. Are they are they present in the meeting or are they going to talk or anybody Hello. else? Or is it just yourself and Mr. Hurst? No, Sarah Johnson, I'm just a private citizen. That's absolutely, there's nothing just about being a private <laughs> citizen. <laughs> a local resident is absolutely fine. If you wish to uh, speak or say anything, please do. Okay, okay. when it comes to the relevant Thanks. sessions. Thanks. Thank you. Um, representatives then for Bish and Russell, please. Good morning, ma'am. Hannah Millman from SF Planning on behalf of Miss Bish and Mr. Russell. Um, oh, I've taken account of what you said about specific site allocation session. Yeah. Um, I am in attendance for that one. So it may be that I'm just listening in today and may not need to contribute. But okay. if I do, um, obviously, I'll put my hand up. Thank you. If you are in that session, then that's great. Um, and I am aware that your um, clients have put forward an emission site, so I won't be discussing that, So, but you're fully aware of that. That's fine, thank you. Uh, Wislow Action Group, please. Yeah, uh, Dave Toms representing WAG. In view of your comments regarding specific sites, we will defer our comments until the continuation of matter five. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Toms. Uh, Ms. Smith, I know I've you have just uh, asked a question earlier, so yeah, do you want to introduce yeah, yeah. yourself? Yeah, I do, please. yeah, yeah. Good morning, Inspector, and, and to everyone else here, of course. Um, I really appreciate um, the opportunity to speak today. I'm a Barclay resident. Um, I created a website called Barkness, which has a mixture of fitness features on the Barkness, Barclay and Sharpness area. Um, as a result of that, I was asked to do the website for Barclay Byways, which was formed by a Sharpness resident during the short Regulation 19 process. Um, today, I plan to comment on the general issue regarding the Severn Estuary. Um, I will leave site specifics and intelligence from local birders to another day. Um, I noticed Bazrag and Lindsay aren't here yet, so if they don't turn up, I might pipe up on some other things, as with um, Barclays is obviously quite thinly represented on the ground here at the moment. Um, I have some interesting points to make, so everyone, please stay tuned. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Smith. That's absolutely fine. Um, Ms. Jones? Um, she has sent her apologies this morning that she might try and join um, this afternoon, but she's had, um, uh, just due to unforeseen circumstances, she's been unable to join this morning. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Johnson, please. I think Miss Johnson already um, introduced herself. Yes, I did. <laughs> oh, right. Okay, sorry. My apologies. You're just down on a different part of the list. So, right. Okay. I'll, put, I'll put you in the right place. Thank you. Thank you. It's just one of those mornings. Um, the representatives for Cotswold Homes, please. Good morning, ma'am. Cameron Sinfell from RPS here on behalf of Cotswold Homes. Thank you. Archstone, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, John Porter from Archstone, representing the um, promotion and the uh, landowner of the proposed site land east of Tobacconist Road in Minchinhampton. So PSO5. That's right. Okay, thank you. And are you present in the PSO5 discussions? Yes, I am tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, which is, I'm trying to remember, which is this week. 
tomorrow, I believe. Yes. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Um, National Trust, please. Mr. Funnel? Yeah, he's not here. Okay. I'll check. I've, I've got Ms. Kendall. Good morning, Inspector. Yes, I'm representing CAM Community Action Group today, um, but only until about 11 o'clock, I'm afraid. Mr. Willits, uh, unfortunately, uh, can't be with us um, today. Um, are there particular areas that you wish to focus on, uh, that you wanted to comment on? Because if there are particular points in a later question, I can bring those forward so that it ensures that you've, because you've obviously you're only here for another hour. Uh, nothing specific, um, Inspector. Um, I think we have an awful lot to raise at next week's PS24 and PS25 um, okay. session. So we can probably um, we can probably leave it leave it until then. If something um, crops up in the next hour and you think actually I really need to say this, even though we've not got to the question yet, please just let me know. Okay, there is I'm just more than happy to hear your comments. Okay, thank you. There is just one thing that I would like to mention after listening in um, to the live um, session last Thursday, and um, then going back over it again with um, action group uh, colleagues. Um, it was very disappointing. Um, the response that we had from the environment agency. Um, we felt um, who was uh, the lady unfortunately was wholly unprepared for such an important session and this has um, because we have written to uh, Stroud District Council on at least two or three occasions um, Camp Parish Council have also asked meetings with um, strategic planning and have not managed to actually even get uh, even get a look in to have a chat with them we have submitted a freedom of information request to the Environment Agency in respect of the River Cam and the lack of holistic uh, joined up thinking um, and any evidence uh, that would go to show that there's been any joined up thinking. So just wanted to make that point. We will obviously bring that up um, next week um, at our session, but we were very, very disappointed with uh, what we heard last week. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, the representative for Robert Hitchens, please. Morning, ma'am. Morning, everybody. Sarah Hanson Foy from Pegasus Group, representing Robert Hitchens. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, representative for Colthrop Farm. I know you have spoken this morning, Mr. Danks, but do you, would you like to introduce yourself? Morning, ma'am. Morning, everyone. Uh, yes, Colin Danks from Copperfield, representing CFL. I'll keep my um, comments for the PS30 and 32 sessions, I suspect, ma'am. Thank you. The representatives for Kingswood Parish Council, please. Uh, good morning. Troy Hayes from Troy Planning and Design here on behalf of Kingswood Parish Council. Thank you. And representatives for Redrow Homes, please. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Coral Curtis, Grassroots Planning on behalf of Red Row Homes. Thank you. Okay, is there anybody else in the meeting who hasn't introduced themselves and would like to? I'm in the meeting, ma'am. Ah, yes, sorry. My apologies. <laughs> I did. Of course, you're in the meeting. Uh, yes, I Mr. wasn't. I'm, I'm, I know I'm not. I know I'm uh, not on your list, um, Tim Partridge. An integral, an integral part of this of this sorry. meeting obviously yes sorry mr partridge yes i did get a message to say that you would be in here so that's my uh yeah on behalf I'll add of you my, to my list on behalf thank of you Mr. Partridge. at junction 12 thank you <laughs> thank you okay right now we've got through that um let's make a start on the agenda now with the caveat that i've put in that a lot of these questions relate to the specific site allocations um 
but uh, obviously the, the, at the start they don't. So all the first couple of questions don't. So let's just go through some of these uh, questions. And I am just going to be following, unless anybody says I need to go and you really need to talk about question whatever, then I am literally just going to go through the MIQs. I think that's going to be the easiest way to just go through and see if anybody has any comments they want to highlight. Taking into account the fact that obviously I've read the representations, I've got the, your uh, statements in front of me, et cetera. If there are particular pertinent points that you think need to be discussed or that you're unclear of or uh, in relation to the questions, then please just raise them and we will have a discussion around that. So unless I state I don't want a discussion anymore because I've got all the relevant facts, then um, uh, please you know, put up your hand and, and contribute to the discussions. So the first question is about the purpose of the guiding principles. Now, the council puts these in to each um, cluster zone, if you want to, to call it that. Um, and it was just trying to understand. So our reasoning for this question was about, although these aren't set out in policy, these guiding principles, um, it's trying to understand what uh, the purpose of these are in terms of uh, dealing with decision making and the development management process when determining planning applications. And the first paragraph of these session of these um, sections in the plan, they're all very similar, if not exactly the same. I think they are exactly the same wording, actually, is that these guiding principles need to um, be had regard to. So it's not a must, it's not a requirement. They're not set out in policy except where they are set out in, in specific, more detailed site uh, policies. Um, now, the plan clearly states that they're guiding principles, they're not requirements, um, and that proposals should have regard to them. Is that really an effective approach? What's the purpose of them being in there then? If they're just to guide, they're just guiding principles, what are they actually guiding? Because the, and, and this, I suppose this comes partly to some other questions that we, we will come to a little bit later. I would just like to understand from the council's perspective first, um, the reasoning behind these guiding principles. I can understand the guiding principles being there for uh, initially setting out options for strategies in terms of trying to decide in, in the council's gone down a cluster approach, which is, which is fine. Um, that's the way the council wants to do it. So that, that's absolutely fine. Um, what are these principles trying to achieve when the plan is achieving what the guiding principles are there to achieve because it's the plan that's setting out the site allocations it's the plan that's deciding what the strategy is it's the plan so therefore what the, the, the guiding principles almost have been surpassed or superseded by the strategy itself and by the site allocations because they're all set out uh, this is what the plan is here to produce to uh, to produce so I'm just trying to understand why why going down this general guiding principles route. So if the council can just explain that to me, please. Mr. Russell? Certainly, yes. Um, I, I'm gonna go back to, I think one of your opening comments was, was essentially to um, look at the local plan in the context of when determining planning applications. Of course, local plans are, are, they have wider roles than that. They also need to provide a strategic framework for neighbourhood plans. We have a very strong, um, we, we strongly support the production of neighbourhood plans in the district. There are many neighbourhood plans which have come forward to date and um, hopefully many more that will come forward in the future. So the, this chapter, chapter three, sets out um, the the vision for the district and the strategy for the district, but then unpicks it for the cluster areas. 
to provide a context and hopefully helpful context uh, uh, under which parish councils can prepare neighbourhood plans for their own areas. Uh, we believe it's worked successfully with the adopted local plan, and we believe that uh, this structure will continue to provide support for neighbourhood plans moving forward. Um, just to go back to the MPPF, uh, we've already uh, had a reference to quoting from it. I will quote a couple of times. Um, so the MPPF sets out the need for local plans to set out a positive vision for the area. And this is the important words, as a platform for local people to shape their surroundings. So putting aside the development management um, aspect for a minute, this we believe guiding principles in this plan will be helpful to local communities to unpack the, de the district wide development strategy and identify what that actually means for um, for uh, sub areas. Uh, we've called them clusters. I think most most parish councils associate with those clusters to some ex to some degree, although we obviously um, acknowledge there's differences in local character and distinctiveness within those areas. But broadly, we believe we believe the structure of the plan helps local communities to then look at preparing their own neighbourhood plans. They don't have to just look at a district strategy. They can already look at um, how the strategy is going to is going to be working for for sub areas below the below the, the district level. So so it, to answer your first question, it's it's actually to help local people. Uh, in terms of in terms of developing their own um, parish plans and neighbourhood plans and uh, various other design um, supplementary planning documents etc that they may wish to produce. Um, secondly, I think you you referenced well you know we've got a strategy so that the, these guiding principles are essentially superseded by the strategy. Well, we, we don't we don't look at it that way. We look at it as this is the strategy of the plan but unpicked for and more specific more detail provided for each of those cluster areas now we acknowledge that as you get more detail into and you you start to unpick that strategy um it's not in a policy we don't we haven't set it out in a policy and therefore we believe that having regard to is is a helpful approach it's more flexible than having a specific requirement set out in a policy um, but it draws together a number of themes from the plan as a whole and, and sets it out uh, in a section which again is it should be helpful to parish councils to draft their own plans and their own policies which obviously would have weight in, because they're policies in the development plan so this is essentially context for those parish plans and it provides some flexibility for in the development management context for developers when they're preparing their plans and their proposals to uh, almost a checklist as to what issues they they have to address in those particular clusters but ultimately they they come back to the policies in the plan that's what that's what the, the full weight of the plan is is identified in the policies this provides guidance context and hopefully ensures that developers are uh, on the right lines when they when they prepare their their documents. Um, so, so that's really, in a sense, why we feel that it's an important section. Um, yes, the plan has policies. Yes, the plan has site specific allocations. But we believe that there's more to a plan than that. Um, in, even in the development management world, there'll be there'll be windfall sites. There'll be things that we didn't necessarily think would 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 happen at the time, or or certain types of land uses, or certain types of development that weren't predicted at the time that we prepared the plan. Nevertheless, they still um, should have regard to those 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 key principles. A final, just as an example, I'm just taking the Stroud Valleys as an example. So. Um, just just to sort of explain a little bit more as how it works. So the guiding principles, they they do identify the overarching sort of strategy. So it talks about the focus for the district strategic growth. It talks about recognizing environmental limits. It talks about Stroud Town Centre as a focus for employment, economic growth, regeneration, and retail. Um, it talks about the roles of other local service centres like Nailsworth and Mitchenhampton. And then it talks about 
the smaller settlements within the hierarchy and and how they um uh, how they fit within so that all of that that i've just talked about is essentially derived directly from cp2 and cp3 in terms of the, the spatial strategy but then it starts to get into a little bit more detail it talks about prioritizing the redevelopment of brownfield land because the Stroudfield, uh, the Stroud Valleys do contain brownfield sites that we're we're all hopefully looking to regenerate. Some are some are underway, others will come forward. It talks about canal restoration and canal corridor conservation. So again, picking up on the canal policies, but you know, in the context of the Stroud Valleys, where there is important regeneration work uh, being carried out, and then it talks towards the end about the the enhancing the valley's heritage assets and conserving and enhancing high quality natural landscape in terms of the AOMB. So yeah, there's nothing new there, but it provides, it, it draws together themes from the other parts of the plan and, and paints a picture. And we believe that placemaking, which is um, perhaps it's talked about a lot, but not necessarily given a lot of weight in decision making. Um, we, we believe that that this section is an important part of that place making agenda. Uh, it brings places to lie to, to life. It identifies the key issues that we would like addressed in the in, in development proposals as they come forward. Um, ultimately, as I said, coming back to the, the main point, I suppose, is that it's a flexible um, section which is about um, having regard to those issues, it doesn't um, bite in the sense that the policies do, but we believe that has an important role for local communities as well as for future windfall development that might take place other than the um, site allocations in the plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Russell. Does anybody have any comments that they wish to add to what they've heard? Mr. Hayes, please. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I uh, just want to uh, respond to that in terms of, as I understand it, these sections are uh, looking to provide guidance for neighborhood neighborhood plans. Um, however, the neighborhood plans are, you can only actually plan for your, your parish boundary or your neighborhood area. So in terms of somewhere like Kingswood, um, there's no control of the area outside of Kingswood Perish. So unless all of the other areas within the within the cluster are are preparing neighborhood plans, uh, that guidance really really won't uh, won't apply. Um, so there's no control, you know, for those for those areas out, outside of Kingswood, for example. Um, another key thing I just wanted to add was um, when when I do read it for the the Wooden cluster, for example, um, most of what it talks about are 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 site allocations, um, and our preference would certainly be in um, Kingswood to, to be able to make those allocations ourselves or, or the, for the parish to make those allocations through a neighborhood plan. I think that would make it far more effective um, because at the moment you have a lot of, you know, this this um, supposed guidance for the area and the local plan sort of making the allocations it, it itself. Whereas I, I think the role, you know, if a parish council or neighborhood group is um, uh, keen to make those allocations itself, um, I, I think that option should be made available to the uh, to the parish councils, to the neighbourhood groups. Thanks very much. Thank you. That was discussed um, under matter one, I think, if I remember correctly, um, certainly in the first week, um, where, and I know that did, I have asked the council to provide clarity on, uh, actually it was under, it might have been under the housing requirement section as well, um, I did ask the council to provide clarity on providing housing uh, related figures. I know it's not gross isn't just about housing, but uh, about providing um, gross related figures relating to uh, any neighborhood plans areas that are in the that are in the case. And um, we did have a discussion about whether any site allocations to deliver the objectively assessed needs that are set out um, uh, would be brought forward through neighbourhood plans and the council made it clear that it, that, that wasn't the route it was going down. So, um, but thank you for your comments on that. Uh, any, oh yeah, I've got a few hands up now. Mr. McLaughlin, please. 
Yes, thank you, Mum. Um, it's really just a, um, seeking a point of clarification on the, the use of these, the use of these mini visions or guiding principles, if you will. And, and to be fair, I may I may be missing it from the, the previous sessions, but taking page one hundred ninety one of the plan, um, which deals with the sort of front of um, the um, seven bale. First bullet point, it says this area will see no strategic development over the plan period. And I think it's just a question of um, semantics in the in the plan, because obviously I've got allocation PS44. I'm not going to obviously talk about that today, but it is an allocate. It's one of the, you know, it's one of a limited number of allocated sites in the local plan. Does that make it a strategic site or not? Um, so that's really what, what I'm lo what I'm looking for here with the use the use of these visions because arguably if you make modifications to potentially increase or keep everything static the number of units on that site does it become a strategic allocation or not and I think I just appreciate a bit of clarity from the council as to what strategic actually means in that context. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go down the list. So if the council can just keep a running tally that they need to respond to these points. Uh, Mr. Austin Fowl, please. Thank you, ma'am. Sorry, I was uh, clapping apparently instead of putting my hand up before. So I've been jumping around on the list a little bit. Um, just a, an observation here, really. It, the, the council have invested a lot of time in developing these mini visions. But as, as I can see them, they just don't really look well placed in the plan. Uh, it's not particularly clear whether they are a vision of what the council want or what the council are actually achieving through through the allocation suite. We, we have the, you know, the vision set out earlier on in the document. Um, and it would seem to me, me more appropriate that these mini visions would sit in that context as a as a further expansion of the overarching vision of what the council want to achieve here. Um, you know, as things stand, we are left with a slightly complicated picture about how these visions would work in 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 um, in reality. We've heard from Mr. Russell that they will be useful contextual information for emerging neighborhood plans and and i agree with that but where they're currently situated i think they're just going to serve to uh, frustrate the development management making process when um it, you know decision makers are asked to consider the relationship between policies and how they have regard to these mini mini visions um if, if it is the council's intention that they want to use it for development management making purposes i think they need to be sort of um, given some further sort of weight of force and actually integrated within policies themselves. Um, so at, at the moment, Mama, I think. So it, I, can, sorry, can I just clarify? So are you talking you. about the mini visions or are you talking about, because I was talking about the guiding principles. The guiding principles which sit which are, behind. The, which, which are separate to, obviously it's an extension of then, isn't it? Uh, that, um, that, that's my point. So Thank it, you. Yeah. So what, so in terms of so I hear the point that you've made about the mini visions. We did have we have had a discussion mm. about the mini visions and how the mini visions fit with the overarching vision within the plan. We had that discussion in mm -hmm. um, in week one. So and I hear what you're saying about where they are located and whether actually it it's that interpretation element, isn't it, within the sections and I know we are focusing on development management but that is the majority of the time that's where a local plan comes to its 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 for is when it's dealing with you know, the policies and the policy wording and to a certain extent the uh, explanatory text the supporting text obviously because that supports the policy uh, is quite critical when dealing with development management decision making processes so i'm trying to understand what whether there is a way to uh well first of all whether these guiding principles are justified whether they're effective whether they meet the soundness uh, element and i'm hearing from the council council saying yes you know they don't see an issue with it um in terms of soundness but uh, i've had quite a few comments that have been made about these guiding principles and um and and the visions because it's all sort of interlinked from your perspective 
what would you do or what would be your suggestion for in relation to ensuring that the, that the plan is sound in relation to these guiding principles? Are you saying that it's not necessary for them to be there or that they should be in different places or? I think, Mum, I think it, it needs a sort of a bit of a rejigging of the plan. I think, as I've mentioned, I think the mini visions can sit elsewhere in the plan, um, you know, in an earlier section to sort of demonstrate how the council have, have, have gone about their uh, their assessment of the strategy, uh, you know, the cart is sort of following the, uh, you know, if the cart follows the horse on this one. I think the guiding principles, they can remain, but I think they need to sort of sit within a, um, a sub-tier policy um, related to how the council would want to see housing growth come forward. So that, you know, in short, Mom, I think they just need to be given some formal status in policy so decision makers can rely upon them. Thank you. When you say they ought to sit somewhere else, is that a soundness issue from your perspective? Is it, are you saying that then they, they're just not effective where they're sitting? Uh, correct, yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Mr. Fong, please. Uh, Mom, a couple of points. Um, one is to come back on Mr. Troy's point about neighbourhood plans allocating um, sites. Um, you're obviously aware of paragraph 21 of the MPPF and strategic policies, uh, which you did very kindly expand on, which includes commercial development, um, should not be done in neighbourhood plans. And these have to cover cross-boundary issues sometimes and wider strategic priorities. Um, Mr. Hayes is obviously aware that there are some large strategic employment sites within his parish. I don't think it would be a, a matter for Kingswood Parish Council to start allocating those. Well, in relation to these clusters, um, I think Mr. Russell has very kindly just given us a hint that in the last local plan, they work very succinctly and well. Um, and they weren't confused with any other policies. Uh, what you probably have come to learn with this examination is that Stroud is, is full of character areas, which is um, separated by uh, landscape and topography. And the clusters actually really define those character areas quite well and, and the dynamic of those areas. Uh, for example, the, the Stonehouse cluster is is renowned for its employment base and uh, a strong wealth of employment and communication there. Um, very different from uh, some of the other clusters. So I think it's helpful as a guiding principle to have those exactly where they are, Mom. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fong. Uh, Mr. Millard, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, my comment really relates to the effectiveness of these guiding principles. and. I it's following Mr. Russell's comments about the, the use of them, particularly in terms of the development management um, side of things. I think he referred to them as a, a checklist for proposals, um, also items that need to be addressed. And at the same time, mentioned that these don't bite in the same way that policies and the plans do. And if you're a decision maker, I'm just wondering, you know, how do you judge compliance with or, or regard to, um, which raises questions about the effectiveness of these guiding principles but if they're not set out in policy there's an element of does it matter it will be a judgment as to what having regard to is from both the council's perspective but also from a promoter a site promoter or a developer or even from a resident's perspective now that brings into question the effectiveness of the guiding principles actually what is their purpose, which is why I wanted to uh, raise that question. Um, but if they, if all developers have to do is to have regard to, there is no right or wrong, is there? Because it's how, it's how that um, is taken into account by a site promoter or a developer or, um, and the council would, I suppose, struggle as they're not set out in policy mm. 
to enforce anything or say, well, you're not in accordance with uh, guiding principle two here. Well, it's not in policy, therefore, is it really an issue? Um, now, what the council said is that obviously policies then, the actual policies themselves had led on from these guiding principles and the mini visions. So the emphasis is on the policies and is everything already in the guiding principles already set out in the policies anyway? So there wouldn't be any conflict. So that's what I'm trying to just understand. So I, I, I hear exactly what you're saying, um, but from your perspective, because the emphasis will be on the policies, is this really such an issue? I'm playing devil's advocate here a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's it's an issue in terms of how how the guiding principles are applied by the decision maker and what the decision maker deems necessary to give to them. I understand they're not they're not policy. So it's the interpretation. There isn't consistent. So there's an issue around the interpretation of actually one decision. One decision maker um, may decide to really take these to town. Another may not. So there is an element of inconsistency potentially. I don't yes. want to put words into your mouth, Mr. Millard, but is that is that your concern? That would be the concern. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Oh, excuse me for that. Um, Ms. Hamilton Foyne, please. Thank you, ma'am. I think it probably comes back to something we discussed earlier on in matter one, really, about the strategy. What are the strategic policies and what are the non-strategic policies? And basically, do the, these guiding principles and the cluster mini visions, do they need to be in policy, in a strategic policy to be effective? Are they critical to the implementation and the effectiveness of the plan? I think that's probably a question back to the council really, do they feel so strongly about them that they need to be elevated into a policy to be effective? Otherwise, what, what is the purpose of them? If you just have regard to them, they're not mandatory or it's not should. So they are in a sense watered down. And is that really what the council wants for the plan to be effective? Sorry, that really is a sort of a question, but um, I just think they- No, that's absolutely the fine. That we're in really. Um, I suppose from, um, what the council said is that then these guiding principles have led to the policies. So, yes. are, are, do the policies say everything anyway? Anyway, do they? The need to principles be? don't add anything. Exactly. I think that's so. Whether they are there or not, yeah. Um, because they're, and I, I will obviously be raising the issue of is it consistent with what the policies are saying? Because mm -hmm. that's what's important in terms of their effectiveness. Yeah. Um, so, from your perspective, uh, you know. If everything is set out already within the policies, yeah. then having regard to the guiding principles doesn't quite follow that then, because if yeah. it's a requirement in policy, why is it only needed to have a regard to? This is what I'm struggling a little bit yeah. with. What is the purpose of them? I can see what um, I'm trying to do. Yeah. What is the purpose yeah. of them? How effective are, are well, they? Well, well, as I said, the, the council is going to have a chance now to um, yeah. just respond back on these points. So thank you for that. Okay, thank you. Um, if I can come back to the council then please just to respond on the point i know you've got a number of matters to respond on thank you um i think the first point i'd like to make is uh, you were taken to a couple of the um guiding principles for the wharton cluster and the seven veil cluster um i'm not actually sure if it was uh troy planning or or, or, or McLaughlin um, planning, but um, there was a reference to, uh, well, it's it's just about the sites, you know, it's, it's it, uh, and that, it's just, that's simply not true. I mean, the, just taking you to the Wootton cluster, for example, um, guiding principle six talks about conserving and enhancing the area's heritage assets. Uh, it, uh, questions, uh, criteria seven talks about conserving and enhancing high quality natural landscape, um, it's uh, criteria five talks about supporting low impact development to boost the rural economy, economy, including farm diversification. So, you know, it's not just about the sites in the plan. Um, you, there's, there's a lot more in there than that. Um, 
the I think there was a, a, a th I think this was um, this was Troy Hayes saying, well, there's you know there's areas within the cluster, obviously outside of Kingswood's control. Um, yes, but there's a the whole plan includes areas outside Kingswood's control. That doesn't negate the parts of the plan that do relate to um, the boundaries within which um, Kingswood can can actively proactively plan. And his other point about um, you know leaving it to parish councils to make allocations, we're more than happy for parish councils to make allocations, but we've got fifteen to twenty parish uh, neighbourhood plans made to date, uh, and not a single one of them allocates a site for development. So um, we cannot we cannot leave matters of meeting the strategic housing needs of the district um, to to um, neighbourhood plans because a not every area will produce them and b clearly to date um, the track record although some of them are very well prepared um, they don't allocate sites for development um, we need to in the local plan which is a strategic document we need to meet those strategic needs um, by all means local parish um, plans supplement that with other with other local allocations um subject to 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 their um needs that's 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 obviously within their power to do that but the local plan sets the strategic context and um and that's as i said that's one of the purposes of the guiding principles to set the strategy within which neighbor neighborhood plans can then develop their own proposals uh the the point about um i've got some sympathy for um for 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 the point made uh by mr mclaughlin about what's strategic and non-strategic i think it comes to sarah hampton foyne's point at the end we had some homework to identify what are the strategic policies of the plan and what are the non-strategic policies of the plan so we have sent um we we have sent the council's view on that to uh to the inspector as part of that homework um so cp2 however also subdivides the, poly the 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 allocations in the plan between strategic and local uh in in other, in broad terms through the strategic are the very large urban extensions and new settlements and the local development sites are the smaller sites which are located in those smaller settlements now we may need to relook at at the wording of 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 the subdivision of those terms in cp2 and if we did that and change them then that would obviously have an impact on the um the the introductory um criteria of the guiding principles for growth clearly in in the guiding principles at the moment the reference to strategic development is the 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 large um the large allocations in the plan there are a number of local development sites allocated in those areas where we, we we say there should be no strategic housing development. So, so there is some clarification to be undertaken there. I do I do acknowledge that point. Um, I think uh, Mr. Fell's comment around the location of the mini visions and the guiding principles in the plan in the document somehow frustrating the development man management process um i think mr fong's point very eloquently said as usual is that well we've this is a tr tried and tested and um approach uh in our adopted local plan and it doesn't seem to be frustrating the development management process i've already talked about how we believe that local plans are more than just um, policies in terms of um, the development management process, they set the context for neighbourhood plans, they are about placemaking and that's really the guide, where the guiding principles sit rather than a, a black and white view of is it a policy, you know, needs to be compliance, if it's not a policy, it's not compliance. I mean, that is, that's quite a simplistic, in my opinion, uh, a simplistic view of local plans, uh, that it's not a development management handbook. Um, in terms of the the question around, well, again, if you if you take the if you the reason we've got the mini visions, the guiding principles, and then the allocations in the clusters 
is so that you can, you know, if you're interested, most people are interested in a, in a particular area of the district. They can go to one place in the plan. They can see the mini vision, the guiding principles, the allocations. They can see some uh, reference to key constraints. If they are if they are interested or involved in the development management process, they will go to the the policies in the plan. That's where they'll start. But a lot of people want to go to see what's going to happen in Kingswood or you know or, or the Stroud Valleys, and that's why we grouped it like that. If you take the mini visions for each of those clusters and put them at, in the in, at the beginning of the plan, and presumably you put the guiding principles in together with um, uh, the the or group them with the site allocations. I don't know how you do it, but you'd end up with a reader having to jump around all over the place just to find out what what the local plan is saying about their area. So we feel that actually the structure, it's not a normal structure of a local plan, but we're not trying to do a normal local plan. You know, we are trying to do something which reflects the diverse character of, of Stroud and the district. And we believe that the structure grouping the mini visions uh, and the guiding principles with the allocations in the clusters provides an appropriate approach. If you want to look at the development management aspects, you'll go down, you'll go to the housing, uh, employment, and environment sections, which clearly set them all out. Um, I think so. Uh, I think final point. I think you you talked about um, what's the purpose. Well, I think the purpose of the guiding principles is, as I said, placemaking ultimately. Um, we had a discussion in the context of the of our heritage policy, where we were where we, we talked about giving examples of the sort of character of the the types of heritage assets which were in the in the Stroud area, and you know without sort of going over all the discussion again, essentially we took out of the policy some specific examples, and we put that with with some broader examples. Or, or we 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 will, we will do with the with the, with our suggested modifications into supporting text. I'll take I'll give you an example. So I meant I took you to right at the beginning to the Stroud Valleys, um, and I um, and I um, explained how the section ref, uh, sort of unpicks the strategy. So if we're talking about um, heritage assets, yes, we have a policy that talks about heritage assets. And, you know, a, devel a developer will no doubt go straight to that policy. They'll look at the MPPF, they'll look at the guidance, they'll do the heritage assessment, fine, no problem. A lot of people, though, will want to understand, well, what, what is it specifically in the Stroud Valleys that is, is important in terms of heritage assets? So in the, in the mini vision and then followed in the guiding principles, we talk about the, so, some of those kind of key character and aspects of uh, the unique industrial heritage of the valleys. We talk about the mills. We talk about the canal corridor. So we we're essentially giving examples of those of those heritage assets. Um, so we're providing color. We're providing local distinctiveness. We're providing examples of the types of heritage assets that you'll find in you know in the relevant development management related policy. So. Uh, I'm sorry it's not black and white plan, but that's that's the approach we've taken. And finally, we've said have regard because we do, you know, it's flexibility. Um, I, I, I feel a lot of local people and developers find it helpful to have that context. And I think you've probably heard from Mr. Fong in that context that it, it does provide some help for um, developers looking to build in the area and to fit into the local context and uh, address the local distinctive and character of the area. Thank you. I'm on mute. Um, my apologies. Thank you, Mr. Russell. Um, I've got a few hands up, so I'm going to come to Mr. Swift first, then Mr. Hayes, and then Ms. Kendall. I can't hear you, Mr. Swift. Unfortunately, there's no sound. I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go to Mr. Hayes. Do you want to then? I still can't hear you.
Mr. Swift. I think we might have lost Mr. Swift. I'm going to I'm going to go to Mr. Hayes. Mr. Swift, it might be worth you. Oh, you might have gone. Um, it might be worth you leaving and then coming back in again. That usually, um, you know, it's that old switching it off and switching it back on again. Always seems to work. So hopefully, because I do want to hear from you, Mr. Swift. Um, Mr. Hayes, please. Uh, thank you very much. Just wanted to come back on Mr. Russell's point. Uh, mainly around neighborhood plans. And um, I, I agree with him. I think that local plans obviously set the strategic um, framework and uh, neighborhood plans should deal with the more the more detailed matters. Um, but I do think that the MPPF and PPG are very clear that um, a housing requirement figure can be given to a neighborhood area and, and, and should be given to a neighborhood area because that's one of the key sort of you know functions of a neighborhood plan is allocating sites. Mr. Russell cites the you know the fact that none of the and NDPs within uh, the local authority actually allocate sites. Well, I mean I, I think that perhaps the issue we hear is that um, what would they be allocating sites for? So in the previous local plan, for example, um, sites weren't allocated in in Kingswood, but development has happened through the planning application process, even though the uh, development limits boundaries were, were set within the neighborhood plan. The way it should be done, the way it is done around you know the country, other, a lot of other places where we work, um, is that the local authority is actually setting the housing requirement figure within the local plan. It's being established through the local plan, uh, evidence through the local plan. And then that number is actually then given to the neighborhood plan group if they'd like to take it to take it forward and then allocate and deliver those that that housing figure uh, through their neighborhood plan review. And um, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm advocating advocating here for, because somewhere like Kingswood, where, you know, 50 dwellings is a lot of it's still a lot of housing for Kingswood. Um, if that number were to be uh, confirmed through the local plan, then the neighborhood plan could could take that figure forward and, and it could be allocated as they as they see fit through that process. So that's how I understand the MPPF and the planning system should should be working. And I think that's probably why neighborhood plans aren't allocating sites because the local plan isn't actually giving them that direction uh, to do that. So why would Kings would be, why would they be allocating sites now when you are taking the whole of the housing requirement uh, for the whole of the Wooden cluster, as I understand it, and putting it onto one site um, when that should actually be decided through a neighborhood plan review. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Hayes. Thank you. Um, I'll come to, oh, sorry, names are jumping around at the moment. So I'm not quite sure who put their hand up first. Um, I'm going to go to Ms. Kendall, then I'll go to Mr. Millard and then Mr. Hurst. Thank you, Inspector. I'd just like to make the point that the truth is NDPs have raised expectations of parish councils and residents so that they think that they've got a say in the future of their own areas, when in reality, and certainly in the case of CAM, the consultation that is had with developers when they come forward with um, a scheme, it's simply a tick box or lip service exercise in our experience. When applications are actually submitted, they bear no relevance to the discussions that have been had. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Miller, please. Yeah, thank you. It's just following the comments from, from Mr. Hayes um, and the role of neighbourhood plans. All I would do there, um, Ma'am, is just refer you to his hearing statements and representations. It's quite clear that Kingswood as a settlement is not an area where the local decision makers feel there's any need for any development and he's made that quite clear in his submissions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mr. Hurst, please. Uh, <coughs> thank you, ma'am. Um, picking up on Mr. Hayes' point about neighbourhood development plans, um, it is uh, my view and uh, it was expressed when we were putting the plan together as a district councillor that the um, Availability of windfall allocations is understated. Neighbourhood plans um, don't reference uh, larger development, I suspect, because windfalls uh, have a creeping um, development effect anyway, and that picks up the problem. 
Okay, thank you. thank you. Mr. Swift, hopefully I can hear you. Sorry, there's still no sound. Um, I know that you want to say something, but unfortunately, if I can't hear you, um, I'm not quite sure how to resolve that issue. If you can, uh, it, it might be worth it to see if you can have a chat with the program officer to just see. Um, you can dial it, you can phone in. If you can have a chat with the program officer so that I might won't be able to see you, but I will be able to, to hear you if you want to join the meeting from a phone. That is uh, normally, yeah, it's on the, uh, it will be, be on the invite. But if you want to discuss that with the program officer, so at okay. least I will be able to hear I'll you then. I'll send an email, I'll give them a call. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We will come back to you, Mr. Swift. So um, if you can get yourself in on the phone, hopefully that'll that'll work. Okay, thank you. Um, I will give the council an opportunity to just respond back if they wish to, but they don't have to. A few points have been made about uh, neighborhood plans, etc. We're going just slightly off topic here. Um, so, you know, anything further you want to add, Mr. Russell? No, nothing further, thank you. Okay, thank you. I am going to move on. I know that Mr. Swift wants to come in on this question, but uh, once he's on, then we'll we'll come back to Mr. Swift to see what he, in particular, he wishes to say. Um, so, thank you for all your comments on that. Um, now, our next question is in relation to the maps and diagrams uh, in the plan. And uh, the council has clarified uh, and clarified previously, although it's slightly different in this statement. You clarified previously, because this is a question that we had in matter one, because it's a, a, we wanted to clarify exactly what the key diagram was. And, the, and you stated in, in that session that your key diagram is map three. Um, but in this statement, you're saying it's map three and map four. So, um, I just wanted to just clarify that that is what you want to say. If I can clarify that very, yes, very, very easily. Yes, um, map, map three, obviously that was the subject of the discussions previously. Yes. Um, map four is illustrative. It's not, we don't intend that to be the key diagram. Okay, um, right. it's, it's, it's actually almost an index. It's It's sort of saying, you know, if you want to look at Barclay Cust cluster, go to page. That's one, what six, I was wondering. One six two. Being, so yes, yeah, yes, it does. Right. It doesn't. So so um, yeah. So so really to sort of to summarise the the key diagram is map three. Obviously, yes. the policies map is the policies map, and all other um, all other um, diagrams uh, illustrations are illustrative only. But you confirm in your statement that the boundaries and the allocations are all in, consistent with what's on the policies map. Because you yes, say that uh, except obviously, as we know, that there, there have been some changes um, which we are just 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 the top of my head. I think Wadden and Sharpness, uh, which we confirmed through statements of common ground, I believe. Uh, so there are amend and we can talk about those in terms of the specific we'll talk about those, dates, about those but, when they come to it because it yes it's yeah. the purpose of why those have changed if it's about including yeah. additional land then that's an emission site element yeah absolutely so, but, need, so yeah yeah but the the clarification is you know if there if there are any changes to be made either to the allocation boundaries or the policies map then um then obviously the illustrated diagrams maps in the document would have to be consequential amendments or changes to reflect uh, yeah. to reflect those okay thank you for that clarification about the key diagram again because that um i just wanted to make sure that that was uh completely um consistent with what you'd said under matter one so thank you for that clarification um now kingswood parish council um you you actually raised this as an issue about the the issue with the um the the plans within the plan and that they're not helpful and i just wanted to understand why what your particular concerns are so mr hayes it's something i think that 
Um, was this in response to question two? Just bear with me. Was it in response to question two? I know, I think it's later on, isn't it, when it comes to, or was it in response to the actual site allocations? I know I've read it, my apologies. Um, it might have been in relation to the site allocation policies, but as we're dealing with the maps now, what, what was the particular issue that the council raised about they're not very helpful and they that could, I think, I think you raised the issue of um, it should just be the policies map because then that makes it very clear that, that you go to the policies map to uh, see exactly where the allocation is, what the bus site boundary is, what the, um, the particular elements are. So anything further you want to add? Um, I mean, I think that I'm, I'm just trying to check where, where we actually made that. that I'm that sure. It, uh, yeah. My apologies if it wasn't you. I've written down on my notes that it was yourself, but I could be wrong. I, I mean, I, I would I, say that, you know, I would uh, say that we, it, it is, it is quite confusing actually, because there's a number of different, there are a different, a number of different maps and um, it does make it a little bit difficult in, in terms of understanding, you know, where to, where to refer, uh, which one we should be referring to. Um, so I do feel like there's a number of kind of strategies. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, it's on your, yes, it's under question two. You say the status of the maps and diagrams are unclear. This needs to be clarified. Uh, and equally confused by the sites illustrated on the map in the local plan. It e unnecessarily duplicates the policies map. That's what you've stated. Yes, and, and, and I guess also the box, the development strategy box, yes. we're confused by yeah. because um, is that actually the, is that a policy or is that just also supporting no, it's not supporting policy. text? I've said, sorry, I said earlier, I said, I said it, all the other maps diagrams are illustrative. The policies are clearly set out as policies and the policies map is clearly the policies map. Um, I, I, obviously, if there's a specific, if you can take me to an example where you're confused by or it's contradictory, um, then clearly we'll address that point. But I think it does, clearly doesn't say it, the development strategy box doesn't say it's a policy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've got Mr. Swift back. Are we going to try it again? You you still can't hear you. So you've got your microphone off. Do you want to turn your mic? Uh, you've got your microphone on. So uh, off. So do you want to turn it on? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you okay. on your phone. Yes, sorry. I don't know what's going on. Uh, is, sorry to go back a bit, but just to take slight issue uh, with Mr. Russell when he said none of the NDPs locally uh, allocated sites for development. Well, of course, NDPs have to reflect exactly what's in the local plan. So it, you, you're sort of putting cart before the horse. We can't do an NDP without knowing totally. what's in the local plan. So the so the local plan sort of rules on that one. Surely, um, if if we're to allocate our own sites within our own parishes, then there has to be separate consultation with us to agree all those before it gets to local plan, and then it, then they're incorporated if agreed in the local plan. At the moment, we're being dictated from above, and we we then give a definition of. Uh, sort of location and, and the styles as best we can but, but we're not in a position to allocate sites ourselves that comes from the from Stroud district thank you thank you and mr hayes please uh, thank you ma'am i just wanted to come back on mr russell's point on the um development strategy box for example for wooden cluster on page 204 um, it does read like a policy. Um, it, it explains that the the outline boundary, the black boundary, is the settlement development limit. Uh, it explains that uh, uh, limited infill and redevelopment is permitted inside the SDL and exceptionally adjacent to the SDL, subject to policy criteria, with a view to sustaining or enhancing the village's role and function as an accessible settlement with local facilities. Um, because when you go to the actual allocation policy itself on uh, page 205, um, the policy doesn't actually say those things. So um, you are sort of reliant on that earlier development strategy box 
um, to give you that almost strategic policy for the for the cluster. Um, so that's how I that's how I read it, and I just wanted to explain that in a little bit um, more detail, and just say I I wholeheartedly uh, agree with Mr. Swift that um, the ability to allocate through NDPs is is sort of been preempted by um, Stroud District. Thank you. I think just to preempt, um, I don't think it, well, council can come in if they wish, but it's not necessary. The development strategy um, boxes um, are not policy. We I don't read them as policy as inspectors because it doesn't have the word policy in. A policy needs to be actually t titled policy. So that is clear to me. Um, and also the development strategy comes from, it, it's set out in policy because it's in CP3. So um, from my perspective, I know that CP3 is for the district as a whole. Um, I don't have an issue with that myself in terms of the effectiveness and uh, of the plan, unless um, there is something so specific that because it's just setting out the development strategy for the area, which is already set out in policy elsewhere. So it's repetition, I agree. Um, that's something that this plan does a lot. Um, we've had that discussion uh, about repetition. Um, I'm less concerned with repetition. I don't like repetition, but this plan is going to have repetition in it because that's the way it's been produced. Um, as long as it's consistent repetition, there is less of an uh, issue in relation to soundness. So um, I don't think I think the issues um, because it's not it's not an actual policy. It hasn't got the word policy in it. Um, I can understand. Uh, somebody who's trying to understand the plan may think, well, it's in a box. It's in a box. It's coloured exactly the same as the employment box, as the other site allocation boxes. Therefore, oh, it must be a policy. Um, but um, I certainly don't read it in that way. So, um, Mr. Russell, anything further you want to add? No, I don't think so at this stage. Thank you. OK, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Swift. We finally got to hear what you what you had to say. So thank you for um, for taking the trouble to uh, access through your phone. That certainly worked. As long as, if you're still on here, Mr. Swift. Right. Let's move on then, because what I'd like to do is is look at core policy CP5 because I've got a lot of. Um, questions that have been raised about the effectiveness of CP5. And I'd like to at least make a start on CP5 before we have um, a break. We'll probably be having a break around uh, probably in the next 15 minutes or so. So um, I will be calling us to have a shortish break. Um, CP5. Now, the reasons why we um, set out our questions, and I know we've got quite a number of questions under this section, um, were raised about the, our concerns on this policy, and it sort of interlinks with what we've already been discussing about the guiding principles, in that this is a policy, and it's called a core policy, but it's it also sets out development principles for strategic sites. So again, are these requirements or are they principles? Because they're the principles. So it's that element. Uh, what does that actually mean? Um, and it, but it's only related to strategic sites. So the policy makes it very clear that it's to do with all strategic sites. Um, so so that's clarity. That's is clarity. But does it just provide? I suppose I've got a number of and I'm. I've, Sure, I've got a number of people in the room that have raised these concerns. Um, is it just a checklist for the strategic site allocations? These are some of the concerns that have been raised. Um, 
is it a checklist to take into account when actually deciding what site allocations to take? Or actually, are these relevant because you've got the site allocations? So is it necessary to have this in here in terms of its effectiveness and its justification? Um, concerns have been raised that it's not clearly written. So is it inconsistent with national policy in relation to paragraph 16 of the framework? Um, and if the wording is consistent with national policy, then are they consistent with the wording that's set out in the site allocations themselves? Um, so there's a number of, and the, I'm sure there's some other points that have been raised as well, and how this policy applies when you've got the site allocation policies. Now, I recognise this is a, a core policy, so this is an overarching policy. Council's made that very clear, that it, it, um, it finds it helpful to have this uh, core policy approach, then go into specific delivery policies and site allocation policies. So you don't need to repeat that. Um, I understand the council's perspective on that. Um, could you just explain, having had regard to uh, some of the comments that have been made on this policy, just the council's perspective on, again, the reasonings behind this policy and, and taking it forward in terms of uh, ensuring that the planned growth comes forward as envisaged. Mr. Russell? Thank you. Yes, um, uh, I'm going to bring in my colleague Conrad Moore to talk talk this through. But but hopefully we, we've had a look at the the various matters matter comments that have been made. I think there's some very uh, thoughtful and constructive uh, comments which have been sent through. So we've we've. We've given that some considerable thoughts uh, before today's session. So I'm going to bring, if you're happy, I'll bring my colleague Conrad uh, in to, of course, yes. to describe what, what, what we'd like to propose. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you, Mark, for setting the context there. And um, you're quite right. <clears throat> we, we have been listening carefully to the inspectors' comments and concerns on uh, repetition. We've also taken account that the plan should be read as a whole. And we've also been reflecting upon the comments um, made during the representation periods. And we come to the conclusion, we do understand the, the criticism and concerns like um, duplication and the policy being unmeasurable. Um, so to cut a long story short, uh, as officers, we could recommend um, the deletion of policy CP5. Um, but there is one element. It is the final paragraph of the policy, which has the requirements for construction environmental management plans. Now, that paragraph, we would be happy to insert as a new paragraph at the end of policy ES3. Sorry, I'm just being disturbed by a call. Um, yeah, uh, so we would be That's happy. Fine, I was making some notes, so yeah. that's absolutely fine. Um, let's just go to ES3 just for a minute. I know we've dealt with ES3, but um, let's just go. Yes, that's your. That's the maintaining quality of life within our environmental limits. So we would add the final paragraph of CP5 in as a final paragraph to that policy. The CEMP is in the glossary. And as for... Um, as for uh, the 
the implementation of that. Uh, we're happy for homework to add text support uh, te text to the supporting text at ES3. Essentially, all the criteria within CP5 are covered in ES3 and DCP1. So we understand the repetition elements of that. Does that, because um, obviously it's not just CP5 that would go, it would also be uh, elements of the supporting text or would the entire supporting text go as well? Or would elements need to be retained else or be moved elsewhere within the plan? I would be happy to take that as homework, as a suggestion, okay. uh, subject to further review. Well, I'm going to open up the, the discussion to say, um, having heard what the council said, does anybody wish to make any comments? As in that raises uh, concerns or not? The um, the council suggestions that this policy is deleted, Mr. Flanagan. Yes, ma'am. Just um, I think that would is a very sensible suggestion, actually. So we would just support the council in that. Our concerns in our written submissions were duplication, etc. So that would seem to um, deal with and accept Mr. Moore's point on the carrying forward the last paragraph. That also seems sensible. So we've no problem with that at all. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Moore, can I just confirm when you reference uh, the glossary where you've got the definition of uh, construction environmental management plan in there? Yes, um, that's on page I, 329. If it is, yeah, I've got it in front of me. Yeah. Um, sorry, I just wanted to just clarify what you meant. Are you proposing to make changes to this then to actually give more? Or are you proposing no additional changes need to be made to ES3 to, to um, give some more detail on what that will entail? That would be as part of the supporting text to ES3. To ES3. That's what I thought. OK, that's fine. Okay. And would try to address any remaining concerns that were made in the representations. Okay. Any other queries or questions on that? Thank you for that suggestion. That's very helpful. Well, we took into account, you know, your wish to facilitate things. I think it's the issue, um, no, myself and my colleague will certainly appreciate your um, your suggestion and taking uh, our comments on board about repetition. Um, the issue is around consistency and actually what what's the policy is trying to achieve. So we, we certainly appreciate the council going down that route of um, suggesting that as a deletion. So thank you for that. If you can set that out in the suggested list or the draft potential suggested list, um, including the any changes to the supporting text. Um, probably I won't necessarily give a deadline at the moment. Um, I might give a deadline at the end of the week to to then tell you it, we usually give like a two week grace period but I am aware that obviously we've got this week you may need slightly longer because you've got if we're sitting this week and we're sitting all of next week as well yes so I may I'll give you a little bit longer don't worry probably the middle of June so it'll you'll have a few a couple of weeks to uh, to sort these elements out um again the the list of of main modifications is, is as, as I've already said is a moving feast anyway so um it doesn't have to be um to be all set out at this stage at the moment so that's fine Okay, right. So thank you for that. We can move on. What I think I would like to do then um, is take a break now because then we'll move on to question four. But 
with the caveat that some of these questions relate to site allocation. So actually, I will only want to discuss certain aspects of question four as we move on. Sounds like we've got an awful lot of questions still to go. But actually, a lot of or some of these ones that I've got, there's not that much I want to discuss on, on some of them. So, um, and I know, uh, Ms. Smith, we will be getting to question eight. So don't worry. I know that you've raised that as a concern. We will be getting to question eight uh, uh, today. So we'll be going through all of the questions. So if I can take a break then, can we be back at, um, do we say 11.30? So it's just over, it's about 19 minutes break. Uh, I'll see you back here then. Thank you. Make sure you put your cameras on. Oh, turn your cameras off and put your uh, video, uh, your microphone.
Thank you, everyone. If we can make a start back now. OK, let's move on to question four. And this question is about the capacity figures that are set out within each site allocation. Now, on the caveat that I raised yesterday, uh, the, earlier this morning, um, Obviously, we'll be discussing capacity and deliverability and, and everything else in relation to site allocations as we go through each uh, each separate element over the next uh, two weeks. Um, so, and the council has set out, so what I don't wanna do is go over that now for individual sites because otherwise it's just gonna be repetition. Um, if anybody has a general comment that they wish to make about how the council has made a decision as to how to set those capacity levels, then by all means, you can do it generally, but without making reference to specific sites. Um, but otherwise, we will be having those discussions, as I said, in relevant uh, sessions. But uh, I don't mind having a general uh discussion or have general comments. Uh, Mr. Hurst, please. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> I think the council has a dilemma on its hands because going back to uh, Mark Russell's comments about placemaking earlier on, it is clear to me that in building um, large scale developments without adequate reference to public open space and those kind of considerations, density becomes an issue. And <clears throat> if you're going to create new communities, which I hope is what the plan attempts and tries to achieve and, in, and hopefully is successful, you have to take into account uh, not just the housing numbers, which are of course dictated by government, um, but also how those, as, uh, how those houses are arranged within a development so I think the, the density questions which you, which you have um, uh, uh, wanted, required <laughs> clarification on are actually, it's a, it's a complicated issue and I, and I understand the dilemma that the council faces. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurst. Does anybody else have any comments that they'd like to make of a general nature? In relation to question four. There is um, one point I want to make in relation to 4D, which is the terminology. If the council can just ensure that um, the terminology used is consistent, um, fully understand the difference with um, AOMB sites, but the other terms there are, so it's, and the use of the term approximately is appropriate. It's not a, a de definite figure as it will be determined, that will be determined through the planning application process. That's a normal process and provides an element of flexibility within reason. So if the council can just uh, check for consistency throughout the plan in terms of site allocations, so then don't have to raise that one again when we come to discuss individual sites. That would be helpful. Yes, we can do that. Thank you. Okay, if there's nothing further then on question four, um, let's just move on to question five. And this is about the mix of development and housing figures are included. And, and I'm not talking about the strategic employment or the employment sites where the specific size of land to be developed is clearly set out in those one. These are the site allocations where a mix of development is proposed. Um, but on a, a lot of those, I think, if not all, and please point out to me the ones where it is highlighted as uh, specific. Um, oh, a lot of the time, the, only the number of dwellings is specified rather than other necessary uh, development requirements, such as employment or how much retail uh, is required in terms of floor space, um, etc. So I just wanted to clarify, and the council, you've put in your, uh, your statement in response to this question, 
that where the number of houses and the amount of employment land expect etc is expected to deliver strategic growth requirement then you set that out that's specified in policies but where it's um it's not then that's to be determined at the planning application stage as to how much is is required so can i just confirm then so where a mix of development is required on site um but let's take employment for instance so if employment is is referenced in the policy but um an amount of land or floor space isn't set out then that it would be great if that comes forward but it's not required to meet the identified need for employment because that's being met by the strategic allocations have i got that correct or is it not quite like that in in terms of numerical figures quantum yes that's correct so where we specified a quantum that's what i meant numerically then, i know there yes. are other reasons for wanting mixed development yes indeed and that's i think that's the point that um I, and indeed i think we uh, again um not with into, wishing to put words in people's mouths but certainly in the matter statement um sabbles tritax symmetry have, have kind of made those points that essentially um uh where there is a specific requirement for a quantum of development to meet a target in the plan, then that's set out. Otherwise, for example, you know, uses that you might have in local centres, you might have an element of employment in, you know, within a local centre that isn't specified as being a strategic uh, employment site or uh, identified in policy CP2. But we, we, you know, we, we understand and we, we, we believe that that's a, an appropriate way forward. Um, I think others have made the same points, really. That uh, you know, to make a good place, you you will have elements of other other land uses other than housing and um, and specific community buildings, but you, you don't have to specify them in you know in terms of specific quanta at this stage. This is a strategic plan, and we would expect um, development proposals as they come forward, which we'll obviously look at in much more detail at things like layout and um and, and precise mix in terms of the the commercial realities of the time then you know we, we, we're happy that the policy the plan provides that element of flexibility okay thank, thank you. you uh mr partridge thank you ma'am um it's helpful for the, the clarity on the, the five hectares of employment um representing strategic uh sizes i think in terms of the other mixed use sites where employment is mentioned there's only the brinscombe mill brinscombe port so one um which refers to um including an element of employment and i think that goes to one of your, your later questions about which sites have been allocated a, a second time round, and brinscombe is, is one of those um, so just the, the, the general point is, I think, as, as Mr. Russell recognised, one of our concerns is some of the other strategic sites with five hectares of, of employment land to our mind uh, don't represent strategic employment opportunities um, due to their, you know, their location, which is what we've, we've touched on previously. You have. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Thank you. Mr. Danks, please. Thank you, ma'am. Um, it's actually just to, to add to what Mr. Russell had said. Of course, in the um, strategic policies, there's references to the need for um, master planning. Um, so for your note, ma'am, of course, the master planning process would be where you determine the mix and format of development. So I think Mr. Russell's approach seems fair uh, and appropriate. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, it was more about if, if the development is required to meet the identified need then it needs to be specified because obviously otherwise there's no knowing um, whether the plan is then meeting that identified need but obviously the council has clarified that that's not the case that these sites are not needed in numerically to meet the identified need they are needed for other reasons so and that can be determined at the planning application stage so i'm content with that so thank you for your comments thank you Okay, so um, Mr. Partridge, your hand's still up. Is that a legacy hand or did you want to say something? Yes, it is. Right, thank you. 
Okay, um, I've got no other questions on um, question five. The council's clarified that. So, content with that. Let's move on then to question six. Now, I recognise that we are, when talking about AOMs, this is about AOMB. Um, and our questions here, I don't, again, don't really want to get into the site specifics of dealing with the two allocations um, of Minchinghampton um, and, um, sorry, it's gone, my mind's gone blank now, PS41, I think it is. I know them more by the numbers, to be fair. So, <laughs> so it's the PS, uh, uh, PSO5 and PS41. Uh, um, Painswick. Um, Inspector, Minchin Hampton and Painswick are the two Painswick. sites. Sorry, yes, yeah, I've been to them. Yes, um, thank you. I, my mind just went blank then. Um, so I don't particularly want to get into the site specific details of those, whether those actual uh, allocations are sound, because we're going to come on to those. We're going to be dealing with those individually as site allocations. But what I would like to do is I would like to have a, is, I do have a couple of questions on this, uh, having sort of read the council's response and I'm just trying to understand where we, where the council's coming from on this particular point. Now I fully understand in the evidence that the council's made it very clear that they've worked with the Cotswold Conservation Board um, and that the, the uh, Conservation Board um, uh, appears to be uh, content with the uh, approach that Council's made in relation to dealing with development within the AONB, that the approach that's been followed, in particular in relation to producing the assessment, um, has followed a similar approach to other um, designated uh, landscape areas. I think it was the South Downs National Park Authority that you used. Um, there, uh, so you went down that route. So I don't necessarily, unless there are any particular questions anybody re wants to raise about that methodology that's been used, I, I don't necessarily want to raise any particular queries on that. Um, I suppose, and obviously on the back of this, it's very clear what the framework says about A, A and B in relation to such designations. Um, that the scale and extent of development within these areas should be limited. So, and on the back of that, the council has come forward with this assessment, uh, which is EB39. Um, so I'm more than happy to have a discussion if people want to have concerns raised about the methodology that's been used. Um, and obviously that will involve some reference to the, to the actual site allocations, but I don't want detailed discussions about the soundness of the allocations themselves. This is about the, the actual the, uh, process that the council's followed. One question that I would like to, to start with so that I understand where the council's coming from is this new evidence or uh, um, updated evidence for the parish of Minchinhampton in terms of housing need. Um, now, the assessment of the assessment of determining the uh, allocation of the site in Minchinhampton is based on housing need data from 2016. That's what's set out in EB39. But EB97 has published uh, updated data from 2021. The EB97 was published in 2022, but the data updates housing needs survey that was done in 2021. So my first question to the council is, what implications, if any, does that updated data have for justifying the allocation of a site for 80 dwellings in Minchinhampton? I'm just uh, just getting up the document. That's fine. Just yeah. Minutes. Just yeah, I've got the documents up because the figures are significantly different. So 
I don't know whether the council, if you've, you've looked at this, obviously I recognise that the EB97 wasn't published until after the submission of the plan, but whether the council has had time to have a look at this information because um, it was added to the uh, examination library some time ago. And whether you've had a chance to have a look at it in terms of the outcomes of the survey and whether there are, if any, you may tell me there's no implications, but if you can let me know the council's um, views on this. Or whether you need to have a look at it and consider it if you've not been able to look at it as yet. Yes, sorry about the, the slight delay there. So no, 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 the, that's so absolutely the, fine. I want the, you to make sure yes, you have absolutely. the documents up and have considered everything. So the um, the updated survey, which um, which is EB um, ninety seven, yes. refers to uh, at that time. So this is um, issue, it was issued in April twenty twenty two, and I think it was undertaken in October twenty one. So actually, just at, just at at submission of the plan, uh, the the updated data refers to thirteen households requiring affordable rent homes and six households affording uh, who could afford affordable home ownership. So that's essentially nineteen households in need now. Um, as as we say in the in terms of the the justification for the the site at Minchin Hampton, that would be an eighty dwelling development. Um, and um, if you assume that, uh, as as obviously is the case uh, in our affordable housing policies, that thirty percent of of thirty percent of uh, that site should come forward as affordable. Um, my maths is not great, but I think that's twenty. 24 dwellings um 24 dwellings would be eight uh, would be 30 percent of um of 80 um and the need identified as i said is uh 19 households so uh so in in terms of that updated data if uh if 30 percent affordable housing was applied to that approximately 80 dwellings that that would that would determine 24 dwellings as affordable and the latest evidence uh, is of 19 households. So um, I think our, I suppose there's two points to make about that. One is that as we've, as, as we've already said, um, I don't want to go into the site specifics, but we have identified up to 80. Uh, so the 80 is the maximum in the context of what we consider not to be major development in that location. So if you if a, a site came forward, I don't know, 75 or 70 or something like that, then 30 percent of that would essentially address the affordable housing needs identified in that local parish survey. Now, the second point um, is, and I'm sure local residents who are uh, here will know that there was a more recent appeal decision and which which isn't in front of you so I, I won't go into detail but just just a bit of context that that appeal although the the site was refused there was recognition that of, that there was um that there was continuing affordable housing need in Minchin Hampton from memory and I might be wrong uh, so uh, I think our consultants who supported our case in that were saying roughly five five dwellings of affordable housing need a year. But as I said, I may be wrong, and I'm perfectly happy to um, to look at that. But so so I, I suppose in summary, I'm saying that that nothing really has changed. That there continues to be a need for affordable housing in Minch and Hampton. And that's what the evidence suggests. Uh, and uh, as a proportion of a site allocation in Minchin Hampton, then that, that would be justified by the, the level of affordable housing need that we have identified through the through the parish survey. Now, um, parish surveys are not necessarily um, always 
of the same robustness. I do note here that the response rate was 17.6%. I'm, I, uh, uh, my colleague, who's more um, uh, who's more experienced in these things in these matters, can obviously comment, if necessary, at the Affordable Housing Day Policies Day about whether that's a a, a good response or a, a or not a good response. And I'll leave that I'll leave that for her to comment on the day. But um, that's the that's the latest evidence that we have you have in front of you, and and we would contest that that supports a continued allocation at Minchin Hampton. Thank you. Thank you for that clarity. I just wanted to confirm because I, you ha I don't think you'd referenced it um, within your response to the question. So that's I just wanted clarity on that. So thank you for that. Now, I've got a number of uh, hands that are up, so I'm going to come to those now. Um, Ms. Schwartz, please. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I have a question. Um, and I just wonder the extent to which the decision of the Secretary of State to refuse the application for 165 houses in the high wheeled A or B by Barclay Homes in impacts upon Stroud District Council's allocation in the A or B. Um, his decision highlighted the importance of um, preserving the A or B from development. Um, and it was, it's interesting that the decision was made despite a, a slight shortfall in housing land supply in that district, suggesting that he placed his protection of the AMB very highly um, above slight sh shortfalls in housing supply. Um, can the council just respond on that? Obviously, I haven't got this evidence in front of me, so I am aware and I don't particularly want it. So um, I've got enough evidence. Um, I, I, I haven't I haven't got that in front I haven't got that in front of me. I don't know if it, it has been submitted so that we all have a chance to consider it. But um I would guess that a shortfall in objectively assessed need is different to the to, to, to what we're talking about today. We're not suggesting that Minch and Hampton should, in terms of a new site, should meet the objectively assessed needs of the wider district. What we're what we're specifically saying is it should it should meet local need. And the parish survey is an example of local need. So, I, I, as I say, if um, if it's going to be relied upon by other parties as part of this um, uh, examination, then it, it I'd like, I, I would, yes. yes, we would like yes. to, we would, we would need to see it, and we'd need it published on our examination library so others can comment if they, if they, if they wish. Thank you, um, Ms. Schwartz. Um, you've referenced something that obviously I've not had a chance to have a look at. It's not before me. Um, it's not before my colleague. Um, I think it was only decided in the last couple of weeks, Mom. Um, that's why it right. has a, 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 a dis determining allocations in a local plan is a completely different process than determining planning applications. So deciding where development is required in relation. So I'm trying to understand, would you, as part of your um, concerns and as part of your representations, would you like to submit that as evidence? Uh, yes, I could submit the, um, the Secretary of State's decision. Okay. That would be helpful. Okay, um, I'll allow that to be submitted then. Um, and the council will need to have an opportunity then to respond on that um, but on the basis that it is a separate process dealing with an appeal and making a decision uh, in an AOMB is a completely separate process to dealing with um, whether uh, sites within an AOMB should be allocated for development so just on that just there is a little bit of a caveat there thank you um, but I'll accept that okay thank you, thank you very much you can send that to the program officer then I will thank you and we'll get that put onto the examination library and then I'll give the council an opportunity to um, respond on that. Thank okay. you very much. Lovely, thank you. Um, Mr. Hurst, please. Sorry, Ms. Schwartz, did you want to say anything else? Sorry, I, I was moving on quickly then. I did. <laughs> Sorry, no, other than just to say, I understand that they're different processes. It's just that it really places um, it, I think it rather elevates the importance of AOMB designations in the minds of the Secretary of State. Um, that was really my only point. Thank well, I'll you. certainly have a look at it. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hurst, please. 
Um, Mom, would you like to take Mr. Swift first, please? Because he, just in case his technology fails. No, I think Mr. Swift. Uh, how rude. <laughs> my, it's my working phone. perfectly now, Mr. Swift. <laughs> my, my phone. Okay. Um, really, I had sort of some basic stuff about e, EB39, but just in relation to the comments from uh, Mr. Russell just uh, just a moment ago, why do we need to use a commercial uh, development to deliver the social and affordable housing that has been identified locally? Surely we could uh, produce something uh, doing just that rather than the mass of houses. And, and also in the uh, Cotswold Conservation Board documentation, I believe within the AONB, they recommend a much higher proportion of affordable housing percentage in any development. 50, uh, I think 50 or even 100 percent is is quoted in one of their checklists. Uh, in general terms, um, in EB 39, paragraph 4.2, the basis of ruling that developments within the AONB are not major is based on the opinion, as you said, of a Cotswold Conservation Board officer who's apparently referencing their landscape-led development position statement and their recommended checklist in their Appendix 5. This appendix, amongst other measures, suggests a proposed development of over 5% of the size of the existing adjacent settlement would be considered as major. Uh, however, he redefines this percentage as 10% or 100 houses. How can this approach be reconciled with the NPPF, which one, defines a major development as 10 houses or more, and two, states that within the AONB, the scale of any development should be limited and via footnote 60, removes the 10 home limit, implying that any development, however small, could be determined, deemed to be a major development, being a matter for the decision maker, obviously. SDC, through uh, the Cotswold Conservation Board, have chosen to interpret the NPPF as in a completely opposite manner, we believe, implying that any size of development need not be considered major. It would appear that SDC want to avoid th this, these proposed developments in the AONB being classified as major to overcome the restraints imposed by policy CE11 of the Cotswold National Landscape Management Plan. However, by deferring, pro de deferring proposing site PS5A, SDC are keeping the number of houses proposed below their seemingly adopted 100 home limit. It looks like a stealth tactic at this location, I'm afraid. With meaningful consultation and cooperation with local communities, it's, it's very likely impossible possible that acceptable solution can be found to deliver the locally needed affordable housing association. And, and this exercise hasn't happened. Thank you, that's my... Thank you, Mr. Swift. Um, so your concerns are that um, not enough affordable houses are being produced. So if this development was to come forward... The concern is that we, we, we have acknowledged we need affordable houses, but do we need to produce, put 80 houses down to get the, the 24 or now less, 20 your, houses, 90 houses? for and you've referenced that the the, um, the conservation board's requirement is for a higher number of it, it's a bit i mean it is it, you know, in, in a particular policy is there a uh, it's i think in their checklists the their checklist uh five i think it is referenced but I haven't got it just to hand at the moment. Sorry. It's okay, I've got the yeah, I've got the the plan, so I can have a look at that. But if you know, not not that I agree with the CCP uh, uh, solution or, or or philosophy at all. But if you are going down that route, then you should use the whole of their uh, thinking, not just the, the bits. 
that are convenient. Um, you raised the issue about major development. Yes. Um, obviously, there is a footnote in the framework which yeah. specifically uh, means that the definition of major development set out in the framework doesn't apply to AONB. Exactly. But I'm saying that I believe that the intent of that footnote is that anything even smaller than 10 could be considered major because of the sensitivity of AONBs. So you're SD saying, oh, right, OK. Saying the, the limit is now anything. And you then ha and, it, and it's, it's down to the decision maker. They have used this officer of CCB as the decision maker, apparently, who seems to think 100 houses is or up to 100 houses is OK and not major and yet five yards on the other side of the limit of the AOMB 10 houses would be major it's it's nonsensical and illogical thank you mr swift i will come i'll come back to the council giving a response on your points that you've made i'm just going to bring in mr hurst now thank yeah. you mr hurst thank you ma'am um Pat Swift has um, uh, probably made a number of the points that I was going to bring in more eloquently than I. The, the, in order to achieve what you want in terms of affordable housing, you have to accept 70%, uh, 30%, 70%, which is the ratio contained within the local plan. Um, you have to take 70% of something that is um, uh, more damaging. However, um, my issues in relation to PSO5 and PSO5A, we will be raising with you tomorrow, uh, largely, because I think that's the way you want to take it. <clears throat> um, we have a, um, a, a wonder, a, a question in our minds as to whether the number of um, potential houses which are now being offered within, within the original plan, uh, both in the uh, south of the district and um, the, the later stuff which has now been offered in the north uh, is of sufficient volume, potentially go, going towards over-provision now, whether it's sufficient volume to actually um, uh, mitigate against any justification for putting anything into the AOND. Uh, the, 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 the issues around that really are in relation perhaps to build rates on large allocations. Um, I think part of the local plan uh, anticipation is that build rates have to be managed, uh, but that looks primarily, I think, at traditional forms of construction. It takes no account whatsoever of prefabrication. Uh, prefabrication delivers much, much faster, so build rates can be achieved in, um, in greater numbers on on fewer sites so but apart from that we uh as you know in a previous uh, conversation we have banged on about the way in which um, affordable houses are allocated through home seeker but uh, i want to correct a statement that mr R russell made in the meeting on the 8th of march <clears throat> Um, in the session, um, it's at uh, the marker 6.40.23. Um, and goes on to 6.50, uh, when he categorically said, and I think it is reflected actually in the EB39 statement, that the, um, the needs, uh, the, the affordable housing needs which are created within the AONB are met within the AONB. And that is patently not the case by um, by common allocation, um, which we can demonstrate and we will do tomorrow. Um, so my 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 commentary really is about um, whether there is a, whether there is a program need that, that we we do accept that there is a, a housing needs uh, requirement. We 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 contest the um, the size of that. Um, and we will be making presentations tomorrow as to how we intend to meet that that need. Thank you very much. Thank you. So you're you're not disputing 
the evidence of need that's been set out in the documents that have been highlighted. So the EB36 and EB97. You're not no, disputing ev- those. No, the evidence of need, the, the evidence of need is um, is partial in the sense that it, it depending on how you read the figures, it could be between maybe eight or twelve houses per annum. Uh, but we would suggest that that, that that is already being met within existing allocations. But that will we will argue that case for you tomorrow if that's all okay. right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Now I appreciate you. Um, yeah. So it's just trying to manage the sessions and that. So I appreciate you. Uh, you you'll you'll certainly be able to um, to uh, discuss that further tomorrow. So thank you. Um, Anything further, Mr. Hurst? Because I'm going to move on to Mr. Porter and then come to the um, council. Uh, nothing of a more general nature, I think. Um, most of what I was going to say, I'm going to take over till tomorrow's session, if I may. And um, we will maybe look at some of the, the issues which Pat has uh, outlined today in more detail tomorrow. So thank you very much for. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Swift, I was going to go to Mr. Porter, but just bear with me because Mr. Swift's come up. Is there anything further that that you'd like to just add, and then I'll come go to Mr. Porter? Yes, thank you, ma'am. Uh, the 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 fifty percent allocation or one hundred percent allocation I was talking about is contained in policy C E twelve of the C C B document, and it's their item number two, the bullet and the three bullet points covering that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Porter, please. Um, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to make a couple of points in relation to the affordable housing need. Um, the affordable housing report um, produced in 2021 um, is, of course, just a, a snapshot in time. Um, 17% respondent rate was mentioned. So I think the conclusion really from that is that it, it must be seen as a a snap, only a snapshot in time, and, a, and, a, and an absolute, absolute minimum. Um, I think perhaps the more, more up to date and, and um, realistic uh, figure is has been looked at into quite a lot of detail, and is is um, commented on in the appeal decision that uh, Mr. Russell mentioned for for the NAP. And that appeal decision is mentioned in my my hearing statement, um, page uh, second paragraph of page three, uh, gives the details of that appeal decision. And um, it, the inspector in, in that is in October 22. So quite recently, the inspector concludes that there's a high need um, of between eight and 12 affordable dwellings a year. So that that is actually... Um, I think Mr. Hurst has, has picked up on that that figure. Um, the other thing just to man- mention is, that, of course, it's not just an affor- affordable housing need. That, that is very significant, but there's a, a more general need um, in the, the demographic analysis, uh, you know, particularly of the Minchin Hampton Parish, uh, highlights uh, an, an acute um, problem with affordability generally. So, you know, while affordable housing is, is a significant marker, you know, it's, that's not to say that other market housing um, or, you know, starter homes for, for young families or whatever would also be providing something very beneficial for the, for the community and, and a, helping to address some of the identified social needs. Um, you know, there wasn't for instance, a site allocated in the last local plan, um, for, for, so for, for a settlement the size of, of Minch and Hampton, um, 80, w- would certainly seem quite modest. But um, I'm sure we'll get into that in more, more detail tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Porter. Uh, Council, would you... Uh like to respond on the points that you've heard. Thank you. Um, I won't add anything additional to Mr. Porter's comments around affordable housing. <laughs> I was struggling. I apologies. I said 5% a year. Obviously, that appeal, recent appeal decision looked at a range, d- depending on your assumptions, between 8 and 12. So obviously, I think that's that's more than um, an indication that, that there continues to be affordable housing need. 
Um, the demographics issue, which we, we picked up in our role and function studies, two studies carried out in 2014, 2018, identify um, the demographic issues in of an aging population um, in an area that, um, that essentially we need more variety of homes. Uh, we certainly one of the issues in the in the generally in the plan was about more family homes. Um, given the age profile in both Mitchin Hampton and Painswick, I think that you can draw your own conclusions around whether there has been an adequate supply of genuinely available uh, mixed market housing to deliver uh, the needs of the area in terms of the local housing needs assessment. Um, we'll, no doubt you, you'll touch on that um, in terms of the affordable housing policies as well later on. Um, so to pick up a couple of points, um, so so yes, the um, the fifty percent affordable housing proportion that has been quoted in terms of the the board, uh, obviously, it need, the figure needs to be justified by um, reference to the available data in the area. So our local housing needs assessment um, uh, recommends a thirty percent affordable housing proportion across the district, and that's set out in the evidence. Um, before you and again we'll come on to that no doubt when we talk about uh, policy CP9 at a later session. Uh, the issue about major development I think you've you, you dealt with that issue we, we're obviously we have we, 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 we reflect the and acknowledge the references in the MPPF to major development on sites outside AOMB and note that it doesn't apply to sites within the AOMB. I'm not going to comment on that that's just that's just a fact. The judgment, yes, it is a judgment call in the AWMB. There's an awful lot of case law around this. There's um, uh, our approach has been obviously to um, work closely with uh, Natural England and the AWMB board. Uh, you will see from the history of the local plan and how it's evolved that we've we've essentially reduced the um, the size of the site proposed at Minchin Hampton to reflect, uh, in part, the the issues around what would constitute major development. We, you, you, in your introduction, Inspector, you referred to the South Downs Authority approach that we've taken um, in terms of our evidence, uh, and it's and it's really important, I think, to note that the the AOMB board were objecting to um, our allocations prior to that work, uh, but we work closely with them both on that document and on assessing the individual site impacts and landscape and we carried out further additional landscape assessment work on those two specific sites and as a result of all of that work the board have withdrawn their objections so just to confirm there's no objections from natural england or the uh the awmb board to the allocations set out in the plan um the I think I suppose the final point is um, is that we're looking at we're looking at really the process I think through these questions not the specific sites and we believe that we followed due process we followed uh, available guidance where we've had it we've referred to and now we had a discussion around up to date evidence of need and we've and we've taken account of the views of of the statutory bodies. Uh, uh, responsible for um for the a and b matters and so we're we're quite content and that we've done we've gone through due process in, to, in terms of identifying potential sites to meet the needs identified in 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 those in those particular settlements um yes i think that's probably uh all i need to say thank you okay thank you now obviously i'm aware that we will continue discussions on um on AOMB related sites another day. So on that basis, I'm proposing to move on, unless there's anything further that anybody wishes to say. No, okay. Um, now question seven. Now, council has identified and, and clarified that um, three sites all contain areas of BMV. Um, I'm not proposing to have any further discussion on this. We've discussed it before. It's been raised under matter two, it's been raised under matter five. Um, and we've asked the council for further uh, evidence to just clarify 
uh, a couple of points for us. So um, it would be um, pointless at this stage to have any further um, discussions on that. Obviously, once we've received the evidence, if we then decide we do need further discussions, then we will obviously um, uh, set that out in one of our, our future hearing sessions. So um, unless there is anything anybody particularly wishes to raise at this point because they're not going to be attending any other sessions then i'm proposing to just move on okay let's move on then to question eight um this question was uh myself and my colleague just wanting to understand and just make sure that the plan makes it clear as to which site allocations are within the uh, catchment zones and whether suitable assessments have been carried out to identify any impacts and the appropriate mitigation measures that may be required if necessary. Now obviously we've had a discussion to a certain extent from a legal compliance perspective on the HRA um, that now we're moving into more site-specific soundness issues rather than legal compliance issues. Um, now, the council in your evidence, you've confirmed um, that the plan identifies which site allocations are, are within these catchment zones um, and you reference uh, that mitigation strategies, et cetera, have all been agreed with, the, uh, with Natural England. And you make, do make reference to um, specific um, uh, sites within your statement, but we're not going to go uh, into too much detail on those particular sites at this stage. Um, and you make reference to the different um, habitats that are uh, relevant within this um, European designation uh, zone zoning areas. Um, now, I recognise that Ms Smith, you wanted to just to uh, say something on this. So would I you like I to come in yeah. with your, no, that's fine. If you want to come in with your particular comments and then I can go to the yeah. council for their comments. Yeah. OK, yeah, yes. Um, what I'm what I'm going to be talking about really is um, the assessments. And I think there are some admissions from the assessments. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, I do have a number of points to make. Um, so I will endeavour to be concise and to steam along, but please bear with me. Um, I don't know what time you're planning to have lunch. If you want to cut to the council to make comments, come back to me or, or even have lunch and come back to me. That's that's fine. Let's see how, let's see how we go. Um, how, it, how it goes, yeah. It, uh, we need to be careful. Obviously, I don't think you were present in the the week. Were you there in week one? When we um, no, but I, I watched it. I have watched it. Or I've watched every everything. Okay, so uh, if, as long as uh, I know you've got concerns, so raise those concerns. I have, I have, and um, we had a lot of mentions of the AOMB, and um, I, th I feel that it's the seven issue, you know, it does feel often like the Vale is the poorer cousin of the Cotswolds, and, um, you know, so I just want to go through all of this. So if you think sometimes it's not fitting the question, as I go through and get towards the end, you'll see how it all comes together. So, um, yeah, so um, I think that Stroud District Council's approach to the seven is seriously flawed. It suffers from a very narrow tunnel vision and it's based on a snapshot that's already out of date. So today I am going to present to you accepted factual information. I'm not going to give you my opinions and I'm not going to give moral arguments, OK? So I'm going to refer to the seven vision project. Then I'm going to go on to the Southwest Marine Plan and then to the Shoreline Management Plan. And I will demonstrate that the local plan is unwise, it's risky and unlawful. OK, we've heard quite a lot about the climate emergency, and that's true. And it does affect the seven, it affects nature. But it's also accepted that the biggest threat to wildlife is the loss of habitat to man's uses. So not to climate change, to, to man's use. OK, globally. And um, wetlands are faring the worst and they're faring bad in the UK. The UK is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. We have nature reserves and often those nature reserves are faring no better than the wider countryside. They're too small, they're disjointed and they're more visited. And we also know that wetlands make the best carbon sink. 
they're more the better at carbon sinks several times over than forests and they do not have the problem with trees that not only take a long while to grow but at the end of their life they have to give up the carbon dioxide again that doesn't happen with wetlands they are a permanent carbon sink okay so i just want to talk about the wider seven estuary now it's known that the seven estuary is going to face severe co um, coastal squeeze due to climate change. Now, climate change, coastal sea level rises are now locked in. So we've heard figures of generally, I think we people say one metre in the next hundred years, but there have been estimates um, two metres. This is enough to make whole countries disappear. Um, I think although the, pla the plastics and the climate change is now very much in the public consciousness, um, I don't think what's going to happen to the UK coastline has quite got into the public consciousness yet. Um, so let's get back to the Seven Estuary. Um, it has a lot of coastal infrastructure, especially in the lower estuary. 80% of the Seven Estuary is lined by seawalls. Much of that is permanent concrete type seawalls. And we have some of that going south of Berkeley towards Oldbury. Um, in the upper estuary here, we're lucky really. We have mainly earth, um, earth defences. Um, so, I'll get onto that later. So coastal squeeze is a real problem and it's been estimated that 70% of intertidal habitats, so that's the mud flats and the salt marsh, will be lost, 77%. That estimate was done in 2012, okay? So we hear, we've heard just this year, since Christmas, we've heard that there's been unexplained extra ice melting in the Antarctic and Arctic, warmer sea levels than expected, nobody knows. So um you know that 70 percent may be worse than the estimate that was done in 2012 okay we also know now that you cannot just look at one little habitat healthy ecosystems are essential whole ecosystems wetlands support inland wildlife conversely the surrounding land supports wetlands and estuary wildlife they are interdependent and it's not just to do with water. The insects move between the two, nutrients between the two. Um, ecosystems are very complicated and really we're only just beginning to understand them. I also want to stress the uniqueness of the Seven Estuary. It is unique in the world, not just in the UK and Europe. And everybody says, oh, yes, it's because of the high tides and we got all this intertidal mud. That OK, yes, it is because of the high tides that we have the birds here. But it isn't just about space. It's the fact that the mud flats in the Seven Estuary are so rich in nutrients. It's estimated um, they actually, the, 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 it's got lots of worms, um, shellfish, and they go down quite deep. It's a very 3D um, habitat. It's estimated that one square meter of the mud in the Seven Estuary has the equivalent calories of 16 chocolate bars. And I'm just gonna say, I don't actually know what chocolate bars we are talking about so um so it's really huge and the reason it's so rich in nutrients is because of the high tides um the tides are not symmetrical the incoming tide is actually stronger than the outgoing tides so this means all the sediment and nutrients coming down get stuck in the seven estuary they cannot get out and then the high tides come in and they just churn it up and we have this soup of sediment um the fish need some of the minerals that are in that sediment and then the, it, the nutrients there that starts the food chain which then the worms have it all goes and that's why the birds are there it's because this it's just so rich in nutrients um so i just wanted to understand that that um the other thing about the seven estuaries it's estimated that there are 80 percent 80 000 overwintering birds there in the winter now in a cold winter that could be up increased by half as many again or more and the reason is is because the seven estuary is really, you know, it's a windy place, there's no doubt about that, but compared to the other estuaries in um, the British Isles, um, it's actually very sheltered. So what I want to say is, is we have to protect the seven. There's no substitute for the seven. And I do think the 70% intertidal habitats will be lost is really something we have to take seriously. I also want to talk a little about functionally linked land. Now this is land that's not actually part of the designations but it's, it's you know it's farmland bordering it and um you can go down to Berkeley shore and you'll sometimes see flocks of geese wintering geese out there in the fields grazing the reason is is that some of the birds actually like shorter grass 
but there's not one habitat. You know, some of the birds like the longer grass that's not great, some like it shorter because they're looking for things in the soil. Um, so, so the birds are using the functionally linked land, they're using it for feeding and they're using it for shelter in bad weather and they're using it for high tide roosts when the um, tides are really high. Um, and the reason disturbance is so bad is if the birds have to keep moving on, they will die. It's not about whether the dog or the cat or the fox or the rat or whatever catches them. They will die through hunger, fatigue and exposure because while they're moving on, they're using energy and they're not eating. Um, so basically, the survival of birds depends on the weakest link. So if there's a roost or a bit of land they use and it's only in cold weather, or it's only used once a year or two years, that can still be absolutely critical to their survival because it's about the weakest loop. And I've seen little comments dismissing high tide roos at sharpness dogs. Oh, because they're only used in very cold weather. Well, that's, that's why it's sheltered, the bears need it. So, um, so the National Planning Policy Framework does provide um, a lot of protection actually. And I will go back to that just briefly later. Um, so, I just want to talk about, I'm not going to talk about all the designations. The only one I want to refer to actually is the Ramsar one, because I think that gives you the broadest brush. And as I said, I'm trying to step back and take the big picture, um, which I feel the council haven't done. Um, so Ramsar protects the habitats, the wetland habitats and the entire assemblage of waterfowl. It's not about, just about a list of species, certain birds, certain fish, it's the whole thing. And as I said, um, we know that it's, completely dependent impacts on the seven and will have impacts on the shoreline and vice versa. I think, um, Ms. Yeah. Smith, I know you, yeah. you're going into great detail. I don't yeah. need okay. to, okay. I don't need this detail because I know okay. this. Okay. 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 I just okay you come to the specific points and your perspective. Okay, okay, I will. About, okay. About because you've raised issues about you said that you've got issues of, of legality, you've got issues Yeah, of, I have, I have. I just wanted to say to those specific points. No, I'm yeah. not the bigger picture. So okay, okay. That. I've got your, I've read your... other people here did, other people here didn't, you know, because... Um, no, no, but you're thing... here to talk to me, not other people. It doesn't oh, matter okay. about other people. Sorry, Spectre, I'm sorry. Okay. And my colleague okay. understand it, so... I just want to say one more thing about Ramsar. The UK um, has signed the Ramsar Convention. In doing that, the UK has agreed to promote the wise use of wetlands in our territory. Okay, so I want to go on to just briefly the Seven Vision project. And this is the project that was done in the last, um, last sort of couple, over the last couple of years by the um, Seven Estuary Partnership, who I'm proudest to count who know of because they've worked with them on producing the mitigation strategy. Okay, so they recently did the Seven Estuary Partnership ran the Seven Vision project, um, which was publicly funded and was published just actually this year, earlier this year. Um, it, um, the Seven Vision partners were um, organizations like the RSPB, the National Trust, the Wildlife Trust, WWT and others, um, the Seven Rivers Trust, Salmon and Trout Association. Okay, so what I want to talk about now is um, priority habitats. Now, I, um, if you go to the Seven Vision project, what they've done is they've brought together a lot of mapping information that wasn't easily available. And basically one of the purposes of doing that is so that information is available for somebody like me to be able to come here today and use it in exactly the way I'm going to, okay? So I wanted to share this map, but I just noticed that share content isn't working. So I'm just gonna hold it up for you to see. And this is just an example, okay? So this is um, Barclay Peel. And I just chose this section. You could, I mean, it, it's, 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 the concept applies to anywhere along the shoreline in Stroud District. So um, the blue area is the, um, can you, I mean, it doesn't matter if you can't see, it's just the concept. The blue area is the salt marsh, the pink area is the mudflat, and the red area is coastal floodplain. Okay, coastal and floodplain grazing marsh. Now this is actually a priority habitat. And I don't think Stroud District have gone through the process of identifying the priority habitats. Um, the Seven Vision says priority habitats identified as being the most threatened and requiring conservation under Section 41 of the Natural Environment and Rural Communities Act 2006. And I don't think 
they have recognised that. And the problem is, is that they're assigning some of this land to the new settlements and they're assigning it for human use. And at one point they actually had houses in it, but it's part of the settlement infrastructure. So um, I think that's a pretty important point. Um, also, what I learned looking at the Seven Vision site is that they've got other maps. I'm not going to bamboos you returning maps because they can look very similar, but actually there's a very similar map now. You can get this data published end of March this year on the Natural England website, so which validates this information that I am giving you. Okay, so there's a similar map to this, which shows actually the land that supports the fish. And I didn't know this before either, but all that land, similar to that, that's like the low level line land that's that the, the um, coastal and floodplain grazing marsh isn't just supporting, isn't just the priority habitat, and it isn't just supporting the birds as a function, it actually provides food and supports the protected can fish. I, can I seven. just... Yeah, sorry, just okay. a moment. Can I just um, ask you a question? Yes. Can I? Oh, um, yeah, of course. Um, the maps that you've just shown, on the map you've just yeah. shown, is that, yeah. or maybe the council can clarify, is that in the uh, examination library? Is this information in the examination library? I'll ask the council that first, so just bear with me. I know you've, you've shown it as an example. Can the council just respond on that? Yes, um, it is not in the examination library, <clears throat> okay. but um, the, the document has only recently been published, but all the maps that are within it, that data has informed the HRA process and the ongoing mitigation work we're proposing. Okay. So... Um... Ms. Smith, you held up a, a plan yeah. in front of the yeah. screen. Yeah. Is yeah. that? Do you, I, I, I've read an awful lot of the documentation and I do not feel it's been clearly identified that this is priority habitat. And if it is priority habitat, why is it not being, um, you know, why are they not treating it as the, as the most threatened and requiring conservation action? Why are they going to use it for allotments and an orchard do you and, what, uh, you, human recreation uses that's not bear with me. Ms. smith please yeah. bear with me mm. i need to understand the yeah. point that you're making okay my so, point and, is that they haven't you, no, Ms. Smith, please oh, let sorry. me just speak mm. okay mm. i understand you're very passionate about this and i want to hear from you but i mm. need to understand you can't just provide evidence um I need to then understand whether you want to submit that evidence yes, and whether please. I need that evidence. Yes. And then that's why I was just asking the council yeah, whether sorry. they already had it. OK, mm -hmm. so that's absolutely mm -hmm. not a problem. Um, if you want to submit it and please make mm -hmm. a note and submit it to the program officer. OK, yeah. OK, because yeah. I, I haven't got that evidence in front of me and I can only base. OK, yeah. Um, our decision, myself and my colleague, can only base our decision on the soundness of this plan based on the evidence that's before us. Okay. Okay. If you that yeah. by all means do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, now I'm just I am aware that Mr. Fong has got mm. his hand up, and I know that obviously he's in relation to the sharpness development. Is this point, Mr. Fong, in because I don't want to interrupt Mr. Smith too much. But is there something you can assist us on this? Yeah, I, I think so. And I, I think Miss Smith's point is is quite clear. She's worried about the nature reserve and the potential impact of the nature no, reserve. Head there, no, Tom. okay, I might have got that wrong. No. Uh, <laughs> Let me let me try and assist, but I, if I don't understand the question, that might be difficult. But um, I think both the council, ourselves, and Natural England have uh, spent a great deal of time on this matter, looking at what the potential impact of a development, whether it's um, on the shores or otherwise, or, or even further afield, could have on this, and then designing mitigation and other areas where the Ramsar site will flourish, flourish, I beg your pardon. Um, and that is what 
um, we have done. We have added to the nature reserve. Um, we've added in what we call strategic areas of natural green space where there won't be any interruption onto the nature reserve. And actually, we've made the nature reserve bigger and better as a consequence of what we're doing. Um, now, if, if that's not the question that Miss Smith was answered, then I, I'll have to defer back to her, I'm afraid. But I just wanted you to know that it's not a matter that we have overlooked. And uh, no doubt we will get into more detail of it when we reconvene on sharpness. And it's a matter that we spent a lot of time and detail, both with the council, Natural England, the council's ecologists, our own ecologists, making sure we don't just uh, provide mitigation, but enhance as well, Mom. Okay, thank you. Right, Miss Smith, if you want to, uh, yeah, yeah, if you want I don't to, want to get continue into... with your points. Thank you, thank you, Inspector. I don't want to get into the nature service specifically now because I feel that's site specific, and I'm trying to stick to the general and what will look at the concepts of developing on the seven. Um, but Mr. Fong's wrong. Um, I, when we come to PS36, I will show you that the nature reserve is a tiny, tiny amount of this red area. It's just a little tiny bit there. And I will show you, um, you know, it, it's really quite mean, this tiny little nature reserve. But really, that's not for today. So I'm going to move on. OK, thank you. Um, Go on, please continue. Yeah. Yeah, so I just need to um, find my place in my notes now again. That's okay. fine. That's so I'm fine. just saying that I don't feel that anywhere have I seen a map developing this priority habitat, okay? Um, as I, so I've already said that the, the areas support fish. Also, there's another map showing areas that are suitable for flood mitigation, for uh, managing coastal change and um tidal surges etc and these same areas have a function there um i want to go on to um another map actually that i got off this this, this project okay and um this is a really interesting map actually i hope i mean i've got my mirror set up so i hope that's the right way around for you this is the upper seven estuary where the red is okay um what this shows is ecosystem services carbon storage um, ecosystem services are the benefits or goods and services that people attain from the natural environment of the seven. Here we're really talking about um, carbon capture and the storage of carbon dioxide. And as you notice, it says the area in red is um, essential supply. So it's not saying, oh, it'd be nice that we could use this for um, carbon storage. Um, it's saying that basically for the UK to meet its targets, it's essential that we use this area and as you can see, the southern, the upper seven estuary is where, is where most of the red is. And so just to make that clearer, I've got a um, zoomed in version here. Um, it was quite hard to see the edge of the estuary, so I've shown it there. And as you can see, um, the essential area for carbon storage, which means restoring wetlands, is not just the seven estuary, but an area just as wide each side, really. Um, and what else can I say? It's described as essential supply. Well, so I, the don't, national... I don't want to put Miss oh, Smith at a disadvantage, but equally, I don't want us to be at a disadvantage here. I was wondering if we could invite Miss Smith to um, submit that as evidence so I can have a look at it at some detail before we provide any response. Yes, I was going to raise that again. She's always, you, you, Miss Smith. You've already raised one plan up. Yeah. You're, you're yeah. bringing you're bringing in another plan. Yeah. Which, yeah. It would be better for you to submit that. This yeah. is in relation yeah. to the seven estuary. So there yeah. are only two sites that are uh, site allocations um, yeah, but, that mm -hmm. are of particular uh, relevance. To that and i know you're talking about this yeah. in a general sense but i'm yeah. trying to understand what the issues are with the evidence that's before me can i carry on then because um well, also i'd like to point out we recently stroud district council were discussing a battery storage in slimbridge so other things will come up not just these allocations that are near to the seven over the next life of the plan so well, if you can make um, a note to submit that other yeah, plan to the program officer if you can yeah. do that that'd be helpful of course 
Okay, all right. So what you're so what you're saying so what you're saying you may say is this is a vision, but is it law? And I'm saying yes, it's law. And I want to now go to the Southwest Marine Plan. Um, I can I can give you the sections of the National um, Planning Policy Framework. So it's sections that I've covered really so far. Don't and forget section... the National Planning Policy Framework is not law; it's policy. Okay. No, no, no I know, I know, yeah. it's policy. But I'm just doing this to say so you can find the paragraphs. It's um, Chapter 14, Climate and Coastal Change, and then following that we have planning and flood risk, planning for climate change, planning and flood risk, coastal change, and after that you get the, the wildlife one. There's so it's quite a long section, but it it starts at basically. Um, Section 14, policy 152. Now, policy 170 refers to marine plans. And I really, what I want to talk about is the Southwest Marine Plan. So the Southwest Marine Plan was adopted by the Secretary of State in June 2021. And it was brought into law under Section 58 of the Marine and Coastal Act 2009. It applies to all decisions within or affecting the marine area. It even applies to landlocked local authorities. For instance, um, you know, river courses run to the coast. So mm -hmm. within, within Stroud District, um, all of the shoreline and river back bank come under the Southwest Marine Area. So legally they're covered by the Southwest Marine Plan. Public authorities have statutory obligation to make decisions in accordance with the marine plans. So marine plans should also be used by developers, obviously. Now, what the marine plan does is, is the marine plans are aimed to be leading edge and aimed to give clarity around many of the issues I've been raising. So they're aiming to give clarity. So if you go on to the um, Marine Management Organization's website, you can select an area on a map and it tells you which policies apply in a certain area. So I selected the Mitchell Stroud District and 46 policies apply. Each policy uses a mitigation hierarchy. Avoid is always the first one, then minimize, then mitigate. Some allow compensation, but many policies do not. The priority and emphasis is always on avoidance. So it's hard to see how urbanization of a rural area or large housing development so adjacent to the seven could be compliant. I think compliance is now impossible. There is no exceptional reason for this development. We have a room full of people here, a room full of people ready to argue that there are better alternative locations without this risk to the seven estuary. So avoidance is feasible. I cannot find evidence. I mean, I've read through tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of pages of documentation and okay, maybe I've missed it, but I have not seen the evidence that Stroud District Council appropriately carried out assessments alongside the Southwest Marine Plan um, the Southwest Marine Plan has a mitigation hierarchy and it has technical notes that outline a methodical way in which this should be done. So if it has been done, I just want to know where it is in, in the evidence and how, how have I missed it. Um, the Marine Management Organization did respond to Regulation 19. Um, I think they did it under PS 34, that the local plan should refer to the Southwest Marine Plan. Stroud District Council's response was simply that the local plan does not refer to does not refer to external websites because those websites may change. That is the only reference I can find. So looking at the marine plan in the round, a new settlement, urbanization, or housing estate within a rural area and adjacent to the seven estuary should certainly not be supported. Okay, the policies, I can't go through them all, it'd take too long. I'm sorry, Inspector, because I don't want to take up all this time. You don't need to go through the policies, no. You, will, you, will, you, will you look at the, um, re, I mean, I don't know if you've come across them. Well, I need, to, I need the council's response to understand whether they've taken into account the marine plan okay. first. Okay, should we do that now? And then, well, no, if you want to continue, you can. Okay, but, okay, yeah. Um, but... The Southwest Marine Plan, there are three on climate change, three on marine protected areas, three on biodiversity, two on marine litter. There's a policy on disturbance, water quality, air quality emissions, sea and landscape, and also access. Um, access, they say, it gives the plan gives clarity on how public access should be protected and ensures that proposals do not have a significant impact on existing public access. But having, we've already seen that there's problems with 
allowing continued access. We're having thousands and thousands of homes built. It's not just PS34 and PS36. It's also Wislow. Huge number of houses in Wislow walk, you know, a short distance to the seven. Um, so it's thousands and th thousands of houses. Um, the climate change ones talks about habitats that potentially provide flood defense or carbon sequestration, resilience to impacts of climate and coastal change, adverse impacts on coastal or climate change adaption measures inside and outside project areas. Um, the marine protected area has three policies. Um, the objectives of the protected areas and ecological coherence, the ability to adapt to climate change and enhancing, not reducing resilience, suitable, making suitable boundary changes due to features moving and changing due to climate change. So this is, this is why I was looking at the Seven Vision Project and going for everything. I was just trying to create um, the background to this. Um, so I'm sorry if I've been long-winded. Um, biodiversity, policy on distribution of priority habitats and species, um, connectivity, migration, policy on I, I want to, I don't want to go on much longer on this, but I just want to say one of the ones on biodiversity, proposals must take account of the space required for such coastal habitats. So we're meant to be giving it more space, not less space. So um, do you want to let the count? I finished on the marine plan. I don't know if you'd like to, to let the other speak for a bit and then come back to me, please. Thank you. Um, Council, do you would would you like to just respond to um, the particular points that Ms. Smith has made about um, the legality of taking into account the marine plan, etc.? I will check with our consultant's footprint on um, the, marine manage, the marine management plan aspects and report back to you. What I can say, though, is that throughout the process, we've worked with the site promoters. We've worked closely with um, interested bodies along the seven, we have worked with Natural England at all stages in order that we could come up with a scheme which can work in terms of avoiding the adverse impacts on the SAC, SPA and Ramsar. Natural England have signed statement of common ground as well. And we've been looking at this site uh, for the last five years, working closely with the site promoters, ecologists, our own ecologists, and Natural England's experts. And they have accepted the, the findings of the HRA. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that point. The Environment Agency as well, you've heard, have been involved through the process. So coastal skis, climate change aspects have been readily taken into the, the, the mitig mitigation proposed with this site coming forward. And that work is ongoing and we will update through the seven estuary mitigation strategy, which we've already discussed previously, we will be producing at the end of the year to take account fully of these aspects. Thank you. Um, obviously, Ms Smith is going to be uh, uh, submitting those maps, some further maps mm -hmm. as part of her evidence. So what I would like to do is give the council and obviously it's relevant to, uh, well, any other participants actually who uh, in this session who would like to respond will get a chart and opportunity to have a look at that 
and respond if they wish. So I will give that. So I don't I don't think there's any need for any further discussion on that because until we've got that evidence and I've yeah, got that evidence, yeah, yeah. then um, then obviously I can take uh, responses on that into mm. account. Okay. So is there anything further you want to say, Miss Smith? I'm afraid there is. I'm afraid there is. Um, probably done, I've probably done the majority of it now. Okay, um, I want to go on to the shoreline management plan. Now, this is refer referenced in the flood assessment, but actually they've cherry picked and they've chosen half the page and not the other half. So um, when you I'm say they, you mean the council? Yes, or whoever wrote it for them. Okay. So you're talking about the HRA? No, the flood, the flood assessment. I'm oh, the flood assessment. The shoreline, right. Yeah, because the defence is... Okay, sorry. Whether yeah. the defence is to maintain relates to what happens to the land behind it and the, whether there's the seven composed with coastal squeeze and everything. Well, point out the issue, point out in the yeah. document. Okay, okay, yeah, which okay. Docu so which document are you referring to? Shoreline management plan. I don't know if they have it in evidence, but they refer to it in the flooding one and I've actually gone to the plan. So this is this is another admission. I feel this this is the third admission because the first one is the priority habitats, the second one is the marine plan, and now there's admissions here that I'm going to step through because they've cherry picked. Carry on then. Okay, so basically, um, the shoreline management plan 2017 states the limitation. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm going to. This may seem site specific. Um, because I'm talking at the moment about the earth defences between the power station and Barclay Docks. No, that's, but it, fine. It's, it's, that's fine. But it, to make the point I want about assessments, I have to, to do that, I'm afraid. OK, um, the Shoreline Management Plan 2017 states the limitation of the current defences. Hold the line does not mean defences will necessarily be maintained against climate change and the money has not been allocated. OK, so it works on an epoch, the epoch for the first 20 years. So that takes us to 2037. So, you know, the site's probably still being built then. It says the defences may require reconstruction or extensive works. Work should take account of possible environmental impacts and the need for an EIA, which I think stands for Environmental Impact Assessment. Mm -hmm. yep. So we go into the next epoch. So that would be from 2037 onwards. So, 30 years after that, it says the earth embankments will reach the end of life and need replacing. Coastal squeeze will occur, which will result in loss of intertidal habitats and environmental impact assessment is required. OK, so sharpness to appeal, the preferred policy is hold the line. OK, but this is the bit that the um, hasn't been included. The preferred policy is economically viable, but the benefit cost ratio is low. Where the benefit cost ratio is low, schemes may be less likely to receive public funding, and it may be necessary to find funding from other sources. Now, obviously, if you have a new settlement there and you do use that land for the new development, then that is going to completely change the dynamics of whether or not these earth embankments will be allowed to just naturally decay, and they're sinking anyway. Um, to naturally decay or whether they'd have to rebuild. So what I am saying is, is that um, environmental impact assessment and HRA should be required up front. Because once the decision's made, it's, ch it's changing the dynamics of the coast here and whether the seven can naturally expand with coastal change or whether it has to be restricted. I mean, where's the funding going to come from? Um, academics, experts, they're warning that we really mustn't burden future generations with even more cost of protecting more coastline. But, but the money required to deal with sea level rises around the UK coast is going to be huge. And um, we shouldn't be demanding, you know, who's going to be paying for this? It's, it's not, it's, it's going to be another railway situation where it's not going to be high priority. Okay, so Going on to the habitat regulation assessment, it's completely confused about the meaning of hold the line. It, it states that hold the line assumes that an area won't be allowed to flood, but that's not true. This makes a lot of the HRA meaningless. The design of the nature reserve, it makes it meaningless. 
but also that area is already liable to flood. It's already categorized as undefended. It's very hard to argue with the HRA because it's confused. It's very hard to argue from a starting from a point of all confusion. I, I am aware, Ms. Smith, confused. that I am aware though we haven't got the council's HRA experts in the room. No. So by all means make your comments, but we can't respond yeah. to your comments okay. because their experts aren't here. No, I know. Um, I do. I do think it's telling that the guy who wrote the HRA in the first one, he did say to us, um, "Oh, I haven't just looked at um, satellite maps and maps. I have visited the area." The question he gave was, "He visited the area briefly once. I don't know, maybe twice." But an area like this, well, he's, not, he's visit, not here to respond on that. No, so I think. So I, I don't think have, it's fair to um to to okay. raise issues like that because we can't actually yeah, ask okay. how many times did you okay 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 visit i'll put it this way then as a local as a local i have visited there hundreds of times in all seasons all times of years and all tidal conditions so i can only say i can't say how many times okay um i did actually in my reg 19 my response i did refer to research that shows that um as we face climate change and um, we have bigger storms and tidal surges, is that they estimate that tidal surges will increase exponentially as you go up a funnel-shaped estuary. And that modeling was done actually on the, using the seven. So when, when we're talking about flooding high tides, it's not just about sea level rises, it's about those bad storms. It's about those occasions where we have high tide coinciding with really bad weather and you get a tidal surge and it will be like a real surge coming up the seven estuary so it's not just about here it's about what happens up going upstream to gloucester and i just feel that that nobody Stroud just haven't been looking at the bigger picture of all of this they so my next point is i'm going to i've nearly finished um but i'm going to carry go on to this um I was I was hoping to hand, hand hand over to some other people to speak, but but Gordon's not here, Lindsay's not here, I don't think, and neither Bazrad. So I'm sorry that I'm talking so much, but you know. No, that's yeah. fine. If you can just keep yeah. it to the what I'm trying to understand is the points that you need to make. You don't have to go into the detail. All you need to say is I don't think for this reason, um uh, the council hasn't taken this yeah. into account. I'm sorry, no, my mind doesn't you work. Give me all, of the, all the world around no. it. I, I, I can. I recognise you're passionate about this, and that's I that's am. really lovely to see. Um, but I'm just trying to make sure that I'm really understanding the points yeah. that you're making. See, okay? see, to me, this so doesn't feel point. like detail. <laughs> Don't worry, and this is not your. I know, I know you were very anxious about coming on, and you're doing really well. So don't worry about it. So, I am. I, I tell you what, I've hardly slept for a week, and I'm don't, really, really honestly. Sorry. Don't worry about it. What, what's important is that I understand, and my colleague. Yeah. Um, understands the points that you're making so that then we can and then we will ask the council and when we come to site specifics we'll ask the, ask the site promoters to come forward with you know, to, to actually mm. ask you know ask them okay. Some as well okay yeah. so do you want to finish mm. what I'd like to do to before lunch because it's coming up yeah. to lunch right now is I'd like you to finish all of the points you okay want to that's brilliant okay? yeah if you want yeah. to just continue no Okay, yeah. Um, I want to talk about the seven mitigation strategy because um, Mark Russell has mentioned that quite a few times actually in passing. Um, and he uses that as the fallback position. So um, in the con context of what I said earlier on in my talking today, I just want to look at that. Okay, so it was written, I think, in 2017. Um, right at the start, I'm going to quote it now, 1.1, this is the first paragraph. This report sets out a strategy to resolve disturbing issues to wintering birds on the upper seven estuary. So that's it. That's the extent of it. That's its remit. This is what I'm talking about, tunnel vision. And if you look at their surveys, they've gone around looking to see where are the high tide roofs at the moment? Where are they using at the moment? So that's the snapshot in time. But it's tunnel vision. They're just focusing purely on disturbance of wind of birds. So what about all the other urban impacts? There's too many to list. But we know that wherever humans live, wherever humans go, nature suffers. 
the, the, the animals that do benefit, though, happen to be cats, dogs, foxes, and rats. Where's the mitigation for them, for loss of habitat, coastal squeeze, salt marsh trampling, foraging? What about the spring and summer nesting birds, the passage birds, the fundamentally linked used land for feeding? A lot of people in Berkeley are very concerned about light pollution. One of the reasons is, is because in winter at night, we hear geese flying over Berkeley. They go in between um, Slimbridge and the feeding grounds. Okay, I want to quote another quote. This is just paragraph 1.2. Studies from partnership organisations show marked declines and changes of some key bird species. There is currently insufficient evidence to adequately assess the cause of these declines. Disturbance is one potential factor, and studies have shown recreational activities to cause disturbance impacts the birds. But what about the other factors? You know, they've gone down this route of all their mitigation is based about based around a short list of birds, wintering birds, and avoiding disturbance to that. But they, they currently in, they don't quite, quite adequately understand the cause. So Mark Russell has stated more than once that this strategy has been active for a few years. I completely challenge that. I visit the Seven several times a week and I have done so for many years. I visit multiple locations within Stroud District. I've never seen evidence of this list of strategy. Inspector, you've been to Barkley Peel yourself now as part of the visit here. There's no info about birds. There's no advice about dogs. There's no formal parking being created on Sharpness Island or across the other side of the High Bridge. I've never seen an awareness campaign. The warden idea in the earlier version of the HRA has already been quietly dropped. And how could one warden, which they costed, patrol such a long linear area? Quiet refuges? Well, where are these special quiet refuges? My impression is they want to remove them all. Um, yesterday I went to Sharpness picnic site and there was a bin overflowing and rubbish from it had got strewn across the grass. So, you know, the strategy talks about bins, parking, leaflets. I, I just don't see it. And it's been happening for a few years. Well, I just haven't seen it. And if I haven't seen it, how have other people seen it? People, well, I don't have a dog, but how have other people seen it? Okay, um... I think WWT at Slingbridge, the, the, the idea of this as immunity to locals has been completely overplayed by the council. Um, I don't know if you visited Slingbridge, but um, it's not a place you go that you'd go regularly. It's a place you have to pay to get into. It's, it's basically part of theme park Britain. And I'm not criticizing them. They need to raise money for the conservation work they're doing. Um, but basically, there's two parts to it. There's a children's bird zoo, which is set well away from the Severn, and they've got a big canteen and things there. And then further down, there's hides for birders, which is great if you want to stand around looking through binoculars for hours. But it's not for many adults. It's not for regular visits. It's not for walking. You have to drive there. Um, the road goes for a small village or country lane. Basically, it's a tourist attraction. And I feel that they're kind of saying, oh, everyone can go to Slimbridge and... Um, um, final point on the on that. Oh, I want to draw your attention to WWC Slimbridge's two written responses because they clearly don't agree that there's an adequate mitigation policies in place. Um, well, I've got that. You don't have to highlight those because I've got those, so you don't have them. to. Repeat okay, them. okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, Carry on with your points. Yeah, yes. Yeah, the point is also um, the section it talks about sangs. Sangs have not got a good track record in the UK. I think that's well documented. And the seven does not meet suitable criteria for SANGs. Um, we'll, we'll carry on with that discussion when we get to PS36. Um, I just want to talk about later parts of the st strategy, talk about how difficult it is to predict effectiveness of mitigation strategies and how many unknowns there are about animal behaviour and future changes. Um, I also, um, the I haven't got it written down here, but I remember this now. Um, the, the document also talks about, oh, you know, we won't have limits on building near the seven because, um, oh, you know, they're saying, oh, because that would mean you can't build this and that, um, you know, near Dursley or Cam. But what I'm saying is, is there's a big area between those two extremes of saying you can't build anything near the seven and building the equivalent of, um, the, the new settlement, the extension they want, Cat Wislow, PS34, building all of those, 
And so my impression is, is the person who wrote this document has done a lot of good work. They, they know that those are two extremes and you can't dismiss one extreme because you don't want the other extreme. So my suggestion is, is this, this strategy has not been designed for this number of houses to be added. Okay. And so what would, so what are you, so in terms of the soundness of the plan, what are you mm. saying? Are you saying that sites? Well, well, I'm saying the strategy is completely inadequate because, first of all, by its own admission, it's only focusing only focusing on one thing, and that's disturbance to overwintering birds. So there's no mitigation to do with the things I talked about in the marine plan about coastal change and coastal squeeze. Okay. Are there any other I mean, points you want to make? Um, well. It, the HRA, as you know, I criticise that a lot, the process and the content. So I'm just going to leave it at that for today. Because. OK, thank um, you. I've got a, a, a couple of hands up. Thank you for you for that. That's uh, that's been really helpful. Um, I'm going to bring it in. Um, Mr. Toms, then I'm going to bring in Mr. Fong and then I'm going to go to council and then we are going to break for lunch. OK, so I'm just going to make that clear. So, uh, Mr. Toms, please. Uh, thank you, Inspector. May I say that the Whistle Action Group agree completely with every word that Heather Smith has just said. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Fong, please. Thank you, Mom. Uh, Mom, I often don't sleep before I come before you as well. Um, I felt the passion by uh, Miss Smith. Um, I just want to give her some reassurance simply because uh, I did manage to contact my ecologist while she was speaking. Um, they have had consideration to marine management plan, shoreline management plan. Um, and just for additional reassurance, uh, not wanting to cross-reference the two, um, our hydrologist as well has also mapped the complete flooding events that might happen down the Seven Estuary over a very long period of time. Um, I know that doesn't sound like much comfort to you, Miss Smith, but but um, we will be reconvening the sharpness session. I will have my experts with me, and I, I would be delighted if you you would like to speak to them and put those questions to them. But um, please be reassured; these matters have been considered in detail by the council and ourselves in, in every aspect of what we've been doing. Thank you, Mum. Thank you, Mr. Fong. Um, Ms. Smith, are you are you coming to the? Um, um, are you? I, I know the date hasn't been set yet for oh, the yeah. show. I hope to. I do. I do hope. I do hope to. I hope to speak at, at that one and the PS thirty four one as well. So I'm afraid you're going to hear no, more. Hopefully, um, hopefully, sometime later this week we'll um, have the, the yeah. program. Yeah. Okay. Thank um, you. Maybe Mr. Fong would like to pay for me to have a hot shot lawyer. And the team of here as well, if he wants to, you know. <laughs> right. Well, well, we'll leave that. You can have that discussion with Mr. Fong <laughs> outside the uh, the hearing sessions, if you wish. Um, Mr. Moore, please. Thank you, Mum. Um, <clears throat> similar to what Mr. Fong said, but. I can assure you the council adopted the shoreline management plan number two. Uh, there is um, a committee report with that. Um, we do use that document. Um, I've got to say that it has been a team working on this with Mr. Fong's uh, consultants and experts. We have input to a whole range of issues. The matters have also been looked at by the Association of Seven Estuary Regulatory, uh, relevant authorities, sorry, not regulatory, relevant authorities. We've also been working with the Seven Estuary Coastal Group which has a range of interests. So there are uh, a, a wide range of bodies. We, we have the Seven Estuary Stakeholders Group 
that we also regularly attend. Um, essentially, the HRA looks at a whole range of impact pathways. So we have we have climate change, we have the recreational, we had the bird disturbance, we had the lighting again, that's an linked with the urban impact. So all these matters have been looked at at some detail. Now, uh, the, the good lady made some comments um, regarding um, the, the HOA. At each stage of the plan making process, we've updated and amended the HRA to tackle an, a number of the issues which have been raised. So there are those matters. And then finally, I shall try and keep it short. Uh, we have looked at the functionally linked land which is ecologically supporting the populations. And that this is one of the delays for coming up with the, the latest mitigation strategy uh, is working with Natural England on their, uh, on their functionally linked land study work. So yes, that is going on. Mitigation, will take the form of a nature reserve, 35 hectares with no excess and manage to provide a suitable habitat for wintering birds. Um, this will be effective as it, as it will be wetland habitats rather than agricultural land, i.e. better for the birds and will be kept free of disturbance. Um, the other it's, sorry, I'm looking at uh, a number of documents here, so apologies okay. for the, the delay, Mark. That's fine, don't worry. In terms of the, the mitigation strategy, a lot has happened on the ground. We provided facilities for cattle handling, for uh, land north of um, land north of the wetlands and wildfowl trust, so they could reintroduce grazing on um, key areas of the marshland. And one of the the issues was succession on the marshland taking place. So there have been a, a whole a range of projects that we've done, the car parking at Slimbridge Village uh, on the way down to Slimbridge was to address some of the recreational impacts and allow people to have access uh, to that area. We've worked with the um, trust um, in terms of information giving and uh, continuing their role as a, a sort of honeypot, which does act as relieving pressure on other more sensitive areas along the estuary. Uh, we've been a, a strong advocate of widening the, um, widening the, the uh, catchment area and the need for mitigation strategies in light of the early work that we did in Stroud. So this is why we engage with the Seven Estuary Partnership, the Association of Seven Estuary Relevant Authorities. Uh, so there, there's a lot of work that does go on behind the scenes. Um, I'm just looking through, um, the, the hold the line uh, and the SMP to, yes, we have taken account of that. And the SM, SMP is also being reviewed at the moment uh, with the, the Environment Agency and the Seven Estuary Coastal Group. So obviously we will keep an eye 
on that and any implications that arise from that review. But again, it, it's another thing that we're actively working with experts uh, uh, along the, the estuary. Um, I'm just quickly flicking through, uh, sorry, I've got a rather lot. Uh, the, you've heard from the Environment Agency and the climate change aspects. Uh, for example, when the SMP2 was adopted, part of that was having adequate mitigation for holding the line. And they had areas which the Environment Agency have secured as mitigation uh, on the Forest of Dean side that allows uh, inundation by water on a, a, on a regular basis as compensation. They're creating salt marsh and wetland habitats. And that was from the SMP, which was also subject to the habitat rigs approach. So all of us are working together in combination. And I, I've got to draw attention to that the latest seven estuary work isn't just Stroud acting alone. It is in combination with the other authorities within Gloucestershire. And we're also liaising with South Gloucestershire and bodies such as Wessex Water, for example, who uh, and the Wessex region of the Environment Agency. So again, it, it's many of these aspects are happening. And I just come back to, you've heard from the Environment Agency, you've got the statement of common ground, you've heard from Natural England, you've got the statement of common ground. Uh, and I shall finish there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Conrad. Okay, um, what I'm proposing to do then is, unless there's anything anybody else wants to say on question eight, I'm proposing to come back after lunch and move on to some of the other questions. So unless there is anything else that anybody wants to say in relation to question eight and the general matters, um, I recognize that aspects will be raised when we come to some of the site allocation elements. Um, so, Ms. Smith, you're, you've got your hand yeah. still up. Oh, oh sorry. Um, well, I, I just want to say just one um, thing. I didn't mean to deliberately hang, have it up. I didn't know I'd have another chance. Yeah, um, yeah. the council's saying, yeah, we did this, we did that, and they're name dropping Natural England, say this, Natural Environment, and you say that. Um, we know these organisations have been underfunded. Um, natural England, apparently, um, one employee used to look after eight SSSIs, now they have 40. Um, they do not have the time to go through in detail and check all of this information. Um, when it comes to, to um, and also the danger is, if, if you just say, okay, Natural England say this, so it's right, that's okay. I mean, how they get the work come across the desk, they don't know the local area, do they go into the detail? Do they just use the date, the info they're fed by the council, um, the HRA guy, like Natural England, did he get all his muddled up? He said, oh, it's hold the line, that it won't flood. You know, it may be that people are not getting given the correct information on the line or they don't have time to go into the detail. The danger is if you always go, Natural England say this, I'm going to say that, it completely undermines everyone else. So you have these organisations designed to protect the environment, but when they're so underfunded and understaffed and they cannot do their job, that they're just used as an argument to shut everybody else up, well, that's the quickest way to just completely destroy the environment and nature, isn't it? Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Uh, Mr. Toms, please. Uh, thank you, Inspector. Could I just make one point in support of uh, Ms. Smith with regard to PS37? It's important to recognise that this is a buffer zone to protect the WWT from the developments in Cam and Dursley. Simple as that. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, uh, well, on that note, then, I would like us to have a lunch break and then we will come back and deal with some of the other questions that we've got on this session. Um, and everybody will be pleased to hear that actually I haven't got many questions because a lot of the questions I will be going, 
I haven't got any queries on this. So we'll be quickly going through um, the other aspects that are here. Um, I do have some questions on master plans. So question 13. Um, that is probably going to be it, to be fair, on some of the other questions. So I will just come back and make sure that nobody wants to say anything else on those on the remaining questions. But it's going to be mainly about question 13. The other question is going to be dealt with when we come to or either have been dealt with or we will come to deal with them when we deal with the specific site allocations. So but I'll come back when we come back, then um, I'll make that clearer as we go through. So if we can break for lunch, can we be back at quarter past two? please. So we'll reconvene then. So 2.15, please. Thank you.
Welcome back, everybody. Let's make a start. Okay, moving on to question nine. We've already had a discussion regarding open space standards under matter 10. So unless there are any further comments that anyone wishes me to listen to, then I propose we move on. So if there are any comments, then please make them. But um, no, okay. Let's move on to question 10 then. Amendments necessary to reflect the uh, use classes order. I've no further queries regarding this question either. So council's clarified that all necessary changes have been made and if any other changes are necessary, we can consider that as we go through the policies, etc. So unless anybody's got any queries on that, I'm proposing to move on. Um, question 11. Now, uh, I'm happy to have a discussion here on this uh, point. Uh, it, again, it's very general at this stage, but of course we will be looking at the specific wording of each individual site allocation as we go through them. Um, so the reasoning for us including this is whether uh, specific requirements that are very site specific need to be set out within each of the uh, site allocations um, because they're not always set out um, as such. But as I said, we will be dealing with that with individual site allocations as we start to go through those. So unless anybody's got anything to, they want to comment in on that, then I am content to move on. No? Move on to question 12 then. Now, thank you. Council has um, usefully confirmed in their statement that four sites were allocated in the previous 2015 plan, which were Brimscombe Mill, Brimscombe Port, Huntsgrove Extension and Sharpness Docks. And the council also helpfully summarizes progress that's being made on those, uh, on those sites. Um, Mr. Hurst, you've put your your hand up. Uh, th thank you, ma'am. Uh, I wonder if I could, through you, ask uh, the council to check something out for me, which is pertinent to our conversations tomorrow, which is in relevance to a site um, at the bottom of the map. Uh, the postcode reference is GL5, 2TG. What, what, site, what site allocation are we talking about? It's, it's not allocated in the current plan. I've been back while we've had lunch. I've been back through two iterations of the plan, and it wasn't in there either. But it's a brownfield site, which I know has had planning history, and I cannot for the life of me track it. I'm hoping that something could be found out for tomorrow. Um, could I, can I suggest, we, we aren't actually going to be on long now, so can I suggest that once we finish this meeting, you contact the council direct Yes. and, and, and say, and, and sort of have that discussion with them? Thank you, that was, that's if very helpful. If you think helpful. it's pertinent to tomorrow's discussion, then um, very much so, yes. we're not going to be on here for too long now. So, okay, um, thank you. I'll, okay, I'll, lovely. I'll, I'll thank you. I'll turn that now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Obviously, we're going to be having further discussions on the soundness of these uh, sites that have been in the previous uh, plans. And obviously, irrespective of whether they've been in the in previous plans or not, or actually, it's not irrespective. Um, what's the word? The issue that uh, we always look at is why haven't the sites come forward? So if they have been in previous plans, we want to understand why they haven't been uh, brought forward and whether those sticking points or those constraints or those issues um, still exist. So um, 
but the, the council has set out that their progress has been made and obviously as we go through each of the site allocations over the next two weeks um, we will be looking at those particular issues and whether they are still there or whether they are not anymore um, if people aren't able to come to those sessions on these four sites that were allocated previously then by all means I'm happy to uh, for people to raise their comments now if they wish I think most people are coming along to the sessions that they wish to attend so does anybody wish to make any comments now about these four sites no okay Okay, we'll move on then. Move on to question 13 then. And this is in relation to master plans and development briefs. The site allocation policies refer to this. These are to be produced. Um, and our queries on this were about the proportionality of this, the purpose. Is it clear what's actually required? Obviously, there's a difference between what's a master plan, what's a brief. Councils put in their statement that um, they're not prescriptive about what uh, they consider a master plan is or a development brief is. Obviously, in the planning world, it's it's fairly clear, but there are different levels of producing a master plan and a development brief. Um, and council, you've said that you you've done that because you want to allow flexibility, so you're not being prescriptive. So it can be argued that that's that's a, a good thing. Um, and I obviously note the definitions that are in the glossary in the plan as well, which set out um, that just define what the council means by development brief and master plan. Um, and you, I suppose this this is a point that's been raised, and and uh, quite a few uh, either suggestions or um, concerns have been raised about this approach of having of having it as a requirement to produce. A master plan and development brief. Um, one from the perspective of a um, of smaller sites. So, is it proportionate? Is it acceptable? Is it reasonable? Is it effective for smaller sites to to have that requirement? Um, and then there's the issue of leading times, delays. Um, what impact, if any, does that have on delivery of a site coming forward? Now, the council, you've made it clear in your statement that you consider that master plans and development briefs, they will come forward as part of the planning application stage or pre-application, um, and that you're seeing that the, there wouldn't be any delays in uh, or, or lack of implications for timescales in terms of delivering sites etc so I just wanted to have a discussion about that because I know that there's several or uh, representatives in the room participants who are concerned about this approach uh, without going into details about again about specific sites and the delivery of specific sites because we will be discussing that as part of our future discussions starting tomorrow when we look at Stroud Valleys, et cetera. So um, council, is there anything further you want to add to the comments that you've made in your statement in response to the questions? Um, I understand your desire for flexibility. Uh, so you don't want to be prescriptive as to what a master plan should include and what it shouldn't include. But how so um, how does that uh, relay when you're dealing with uh, a site development as part of the pre-application or the application stage? As in, is uh, does that form any delays? So if a developer was to come along and say, I want to develop this site, here's my master plan. You say, oh no, actually we want more information on this because they've all they've done is produce a one page A4 master plan. That's it. Um, what's the process? What's the, just explain to me what your process is, how you deal with that in your normal everyday uh, requirement for a, for a master plan if you've, if you've required that previously. 
Thank you. Yes. Um, well, I think the, the key word is proportionate. Uh, so small sites that come forward through the, the planning system. Um, uh, obviously, we always encourage pre-applications on on any on any main, or, or on any scheme. Um, and the advice is is currently involves uh, you know a, a, a summary of the council's policy, um, a a uh, checklist essentially of of issues likely to be uh, required to be addressed by planning application and um you know requesting that uh, suitable evidence is prepared as part of that as part of an application and and obviously also a requirement to, for certainly for major more major development for consultation pre-application consultation to be undertaken um a bigger scheme um we, we we haven't had an awful lot of, of speculative bigger schemes coming through. We certainly have schemes that are coming through in terms of allocations in the current plan. And again, um, in the current adopted plan, we ask for a similar approach for the larger sites for development brief incorporating a illustrative master plan. And um, again, there are developers in the room who have submitted planning applications who may wish to comment. But I, I don't I don't consider um, for a, for a, a large site, a, a, a development brief um, and an illustrative master plan is, you know, is is essentially part of the tools of the trade. You know, it should be, it should be, uh, it may not be called a development brief. It may be called a, uh, you know, obviously, ultimately, it'll be called, it'll be in the planning statement and may incorporate design and access statement, etc. But it essentially identifying the sort of key principles of the development uh, it, and and then how how um the matters have been incorporated into a design uh identifying a, a, a an illustrative master plan as part so of that so what can i just clarify so what's being proposed is it any different from what you already ask for we don't uh, in terms of the local sites the local development sites so we didn't have local development sites identified in the adopted local plan so so if you're looking at sites, let's say of 10 dwellings, the sort of minimum that we would allocate, then we don't require a development brief. We require we would we require a master plan. And um there is plenty of uh, plenty of guidance set out in national national MPPF and guidance about the importance of master planning. And uh, uh, master plans aren't just for major sites. Uh, master plans can be can involve huge documents but they can also involve literally as you say an a4 sheet of paper that identifies the layout and distribution of uses and access uh and um uh reflecting the the, the overall design and layout of the scheme that, and, and that we, we would expect that on any small site um or, or, or i should say technically major development because it's 10 dwellings but a, a relatively small site and, and i consider that develop, developers of that scale would would not um, balk at, at having to produce a master plan because that is essentially good planning at that scale. So, so to answer your question, um, we haven't request we haven't required master plans for small sites before, but we haven't allocated small sites in in the um, in the recent past. In, in terms of major sites, large strategic sites, we've re we've required development briefs and master plans. Um, so whether that's Huntsgrove or West of Stonehouse or North East Cam, the big big sites in the current adopted plan, they they have similar requirements. Um, just just to clarify, yes, uh, the the point the points you you raised, do we think it's proportionate? Yes, we do because we don't. Uh, do, uh, master plans can be, as I said, uh, of of varying scales and complexity. Uh, we would take a proportionate approach. In terms of lead-in times and delays, I hopefully we clarified we're not requiring these documents to be produced and approved up front before a planning application has been submitted. There may be cases where, obviously, we, we are very confident that the sites in the plan are deliverable and developable. There may be sites in the lifetime of a plan where the council may may wish to produce development briefs itself if there were a problem with delivery. Uh, so the wording allows for us to approve them. And obviously, if we approved a development brief ourselves, then we would undertake appropriate consultation 
to ensure that it had the status of a supplementary planning document in the context of the current uh, planning system. So that's why I say in um, 6A 13.4, in most cases, it is expected that a master plan drafted by the developer will be approved by the district council at planning application stage. So we just provide that bit of flexibility just in case we have a site that for whatever reason um, doesn't come forward, we can produce a development brief ourselves, and including a master plan, prove it. And that would, uh, in terms of the definition in the glossary, that would hopefully stimulate interest to the market um, if, if a site were to be stalled in the future. Thank you. So um, I'm going to open it up to anybody else who wants to come in, because I know a couple of uh, participants in the room have raised concerns about this. Having heard what the council said, that um, it's not proposing that master plans or development briefs are produced prior to, you know, as part of any pre-application process or a requirement, unless the council's just said, unless the site isn't coming forward and it needs to do something itself that's slightly different and we'll come to deliverability of sites later on uh, during the next two weeks. Um, I'd be interesting to hear whether anybody's concerns have been alleviated by the council saying we're not looking for these to be approved before planning application is put in and it's just all part of the, the normal planning application process. Whether anybody's got any comments on that, whether that, that uh, takes away some of their concerns, particularly for smaller sites. Um, strategic, the, the strategic site is slightly different because it, they do have longer lead-in times uh, and uh, there's more um, more issues to deal with. Right, I've got a number of hands up, so I'm just going to go left to right on my screen. So it's Mr. McLaughlin first. Thank you, ma'am. Um, yeah, just re responding to the point the council the council's made there, and I'm going to tread a very, very careful line because I know you don't want to deal with site specifics, but there's I'm just going to demonstrate these two as just as, as, oh, as example as example yeah. points. So we've been. Um, I'm acting on behalf of Seven Homes. They've got site allocation PS44. It's a technically con technical constraint for the site, and we will deal with those obviously on the on the on the on the, on the relevant day. The the issue I've I've got is that. The master plans, and we, we've submitted a planning application for this as part, as part of our evidence base, and you've, you've you know, this before this inquiry. But as part of the pre-application advice process, we prepared a master plan, and we prepared a master plan responding to the in response to the um, to the 2021 done consultation documents as well, just to sort of and assess and understand what our position was vis-a-vis -vis the allocate the level of allocation the council was making. And it's very, you know, I'm very encouraged what I, what I hear from um, Mr. Russell in terms of the council trying to think flexibly about the use of master plans. It's always, my perspective, it's always one of the first things I you know, recommend to clients that they get done. The issue I've got is what happens if we can do something better? Because the extent of red lines as they're drawn, I can draw, take you to PS44, but also um, actually a really useful example is on page 170. Sorry, page 168 of the plan, the um, BER 16 slash 17 allocation. The red line for that is incredibly tight single access point. And my worry is um, very simply with with uh, with those two with those two examples, and particularly with PS44, the master plans prepared by developers and applicants are in response to allocations made by the local authority so the local authority are deciding where the red lines go around sites and appreciate they draw on their evidence base such in terms of the schlard by way of example but they've not done any work to assess where the extent of these red lines should sit so we're preparing something that is ultimately responding to a, an idea that the council may have that's not actually backed up by definite evidence and the challenge i have with that is if we think we can do better, you know, provide a much a much more harmonious village edge or provide a more appropriate form of layout of development, our hands are somewhat tied by the need to be within the confines of the red, of the red line site location. And you know, particularly the, the example on page 168 is a case in point. That clearly shows that there's an access, that there is one solitary access point. If that can't, if the visibility space can't be achieved for that, or the road layout can't be achieved for that, there's a question mark over the deliverability of the allocation. It's just 
Certainly, to, just certainly to highlight the example, Mum, which you probably appreciate. So I'd just like to understand a bit more from the council about when they were drawing the red lines, particularly for the local sites, how were they making those decisions about how those red line boundaries should be informed as a point of principle? Because the experience we've been through with PS44, and I know we'll talk about this in the in next week, it's, there's not necessarily the evidence there to show there's been some systematic exercise to demonstrate this is how we have judged the, the extent of the local level allocations that we have made. And then, to, then from that, deriving what the housing numbers are going to be. Thank you. You're not trying to get a discussion on emission size through the back door, are you? No, I am most definitely not <laughs> trying to get a discussion through emission size through the back door. I'm Wouldn't always wary of, of these Wouldn't discussions on everybody trying to get their in, their emission site in. But no, I understand the point no, that you're no, making, so I'll let the council respond on that. So thank, thank you. you. I'm going to go down the list first, um, and then I'll come back to the council to respond. Miss Hamilton Foyne, please. Thank you, ma'am. Um, yeah, I'm relieved to know that uh, the council don't think this is going to have any effect on the timescales or cause any delay, but I'm just still concerned about the wording because I don't want to go into site details, but in one of the site policies that we're involved with, it does say approved by the council. So what does that mean? Approved by the council when? It yes, some uh, quite a, a, or a number of participants have put forward some suggested wording, and I think that's one of the words, isn't it, well. that, you're, yes. that you were particularly concerned about. Um, I'll come back to some of the, the specifics on the on on that shortly. Yeah. Um, well, I'll I'll how I read it is that that would be approved as part of the planning application process, but I'm not I can't put words in the council's yeah. mouth, so I will ask the council to respond back on that. Yes. Okay. So, thank you. It's just maybe some clarification in the text, perhaps, just to make it clear, because um, otherwise it's, it's just probably still a bit vague and a bit concerning. But I'm relieved to know that there's no intention to actually formally have a requirement to do something before you do the application, because I, applications have been prepared. I think some parallel. form of clarity somewhere mm. in the plan on that yeah. point, that yes, must plans, must plans development briefs, it's certainly a normal part of the planning process, yeah. um, but some clarity about exactly what that means for the council in yeah. terms of actually as part of the planning application process. Indeed, with, yeah, I'd be grateful for with, that. With the understanding that some sites may need some produce beforehand to get the sites moving, which is what Mr. Russell said, wasn't it, yeah. earlier? Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Millard, please. Thank you, Mum. Um, as you were, we're representing Persimmon Homes and we have interest in a large site at PS24 and also a much smaller site at PS38. Um, reassured by the comments from Mr Russell that this is a process that isn't distinct from the planning application stage because that was where our concerns lied in terms of the potential for delay. Um, so yeah, we do take comfort from that and I but also share Ms Hamilton Foyne's point about the clarity in the wording would be of benefit as a general matter. Okay. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Danks, please. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I'm going to come from a slightly different position here. Um, I think the importance of master planning, first and foremost, is specifically where sites are in multi ownerships or are going to be pursued in multiple planning applications because you're judging different parts and of different sites separately as a planning authority. And, and I, I, I'd um, actually support Mr. Russell in that the concept that the importance of a master plan is drawing an allocation as a whole together. Um, so wh when should you deal with a master plan? Well, I think that depends on how you're bringing forward the site. If it's in three, four, five applications, perhaps you need a master plan first or with the first application in its entirety. Or if there's multiple ownerships, again, in its entirety. Uh, there's wording in some of the policies which talks about comprehensive master planning, and I think a little bit of clarity on what comprehensive means will be helpful, particularly in those situations, because comprehensive could mean related to the application, which might only be partial, but master planning is really about site as a whole. So I think comprehensive and clarity on that, um, and I think the approval process, perhaps that's needed 
where it's only a partial planning application because then you've got a, 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 a systematic base from which to work for subsequent applications and that consistency, which I suspect is where Mr. Russell might um, want to see that achieved. Um, so what, what do you see as the issues where there isn't multiple ownership? What, what but you're still dealing with, uh, you want to deal with the site in a comprehensive way um, it may still have phasing, but it's, it's still one ownership. It may not be a, a, a huge site, but there still will be elements of, of, of phasing, etc. What's your concerns about bringing forward a, a master plan in that context then? Uh, no, uh, as in one, one is needed. So, for example, Mum, if you take a planning application for an entire site and you make an outline for an entire site, typically there will be a, a master plan. Yes, absolutely. Uh, plan. Yeah. Yeah not necessarily the document always that goes with it, but design, design an access statement. That would set the parameters for the determination of reserve matters. Yes. If you take the same site and approach it in a different way, which is you make a planning application in from the outset for maybe only half of the site, you might own all of it, but you can't deal with all of it in one go, or you only want to deal with part of it. You then into a situation where you've got uh, details being agreed for one part, but nothing on the other part. And that might be a choice of an applicant. It doesn't necessarily mean as a landowner, you make an application over the entirety of a site. So I think particularly for the larger sites, it's important to have that where there's not a planning application across all of the allocation. It's at that point, the master plan becomes much more important to go right, I understand your later point applications. Now. Okay. Sorry if I wasn't very clear there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, can I bring the council in then to respond, please? Thank you, yes. Um, so Mr. McLaughlin's point about what if we can do better, I think I've got two responses to that. One is, well, um, the, the time to the time to check whether site allocations are sound in terms of the boundaries and the access is now. So I would suggest Mr. McLaughlin, if he wishes to comment on the soundness of those, the, of the boundaries of those allocations, then there's no better time than, than the sessions that we're going to have on site allocations. Um, in terms of, um, so, so I would suggest that those, that that really is not, it's not a particular issue to do with whether you've got master plans or not. The, the issue is if uh, whether you've got evidence about the appropriate nature of the boundaries. That's something that, that is discussed at the at the time that you allocate the site and, and how you define the site in the, on the policies map and in the in the policies in a plan. Um, there are always going to be uh, potential material planning considerations in in addition to the development plan. So I would suggest the second point is, well, if 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 a site were to be found sound with a with a particular access and a planning application came in at a later date with an alternative access, that that potentially could be um, could be acceptable. Um, that would have to clearly that would clearly need to be evidence at the planning application stage about that. Obviously, each planning application, depending upon the scale of the development, will need to be accompanied by appropriate transport and highway evidence. So that 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 there may be a material planning consideration at that stage. But again, that's not really an issue about whether you prepare a master plan or a development brief. That's about having the evidence at the appropriate time in front of the decision maker to to um, allow a variation from a from a policy in a plan. Um, uh, uh, the the comments about the the wording um, and it is helpful. Obviously, I know I have got Sarah Hamilton Foyne's comments that she made uh, made about specific wording at the, at the matters stage in front of me. Um, just just on the uh, just just for the sake of everybody in the room. So um, uh, Sarah Hamilton Foyne's comments would to suggest that the wording in the policies generally could be amended to refer to the proposals will be required to deliver a master plan that has been informed by detailed landscape, visual heritage and ecological impact assessments and demonstrates an appropriate scale, layout and form. I, I don't have an issue with the um, with 
with, with the clarification that the proposals will be required to deliver a master plan. I've, the only issue I have is it's a bit like, um, you know, you can't encapsulate everything that a master plan has to has to. Uh, I mean, for the obvious point was, well, there's no reference to transport in that in that um, list of uh, uh, associated evidence. So personally, I would suggest if there needs to be any definition of what a master or amendments to a definition of what a master plan is, then they, that should be made in the glossary. Um, in terms of the the proposals will be required to deliver a master plan, um, which is what essentially we've got left. Um, it's 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 whether that's improving upon you know a, a development brief incorporating an indicative master plan to be approved by the district council will detail the way in which the land use as infrastructure will be developed in an integrated and coordinated manner. Um, I, I I I don't see personally that it, it really extends or advances the wording uh the clarity or the meaning any any particular degree but but as i said i'm not going to die in a ditch on it um if it if if, if you feel inspector that uh that there needs to be further clarification on that point um then then happy to consider that the issue about um when will it be approved well i think i think obviously in in our matter statement we clarify that we expect um, other than the cases where a, a, a district council may wish to encourage development by 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 approving its own development brief, as I said, um, we we are expecting master plans and development briefs to be drafted by the developer and approved at the planning application stage. Um, if we can insert that into either the glossary definition, i.e., you know, master plans and development briefs are prepared by are, are normally prepared by the developer promoter and will be considered at the planning application stage that might be a way of getting over the issue that we'd have to amend every single policy um to 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 make or is that it where is the where is the first I'm, i've just been looking at that where's the first reference to master planning in is there an introductory element or something in relation to maybe one of the core policies which we know you're changing um or there's a suggestion that though that that policy is changing so is 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 there any reference made there rather than because i don't think the, the wording isn't necessarily wrong it's just the the interpretation of that word so to be approved by the district council in its own right that wording is fine as long as it's clear that that's at the planning application stage or as part of the planning application stage so if that can be like you said, either put in as part of the glossary or whether there is some reference in an introductory chapter or some of your, your initial core, uh, core policies where some wording could be added to make it clear that development coming forward will need to be develop, developed in accordance with, you know, master plans, etc. These are to be approved as part of the planning application process or whatever wording you decide um, or, I mean, we're, we're happy to look at that. I'm, I just, just, just to try and short circuit it. I mean, is there any objection if we put that, um, you know, consideration at the uh, will be prepared and determined at the planning application stage? If that was put into the glossary um, for both development brief and master plan, would Does that anybody have any comments that, on that? Exactly. Would there be any issue with that? <coughs> Excuse me. Does anybody have any concerns with that? Because it, the glossary forms part of the plan. Not quite in the same way as policies, etc. But Ms. Hamilton Foyne? No, I don't have an issue with that, ma'am. I think it, as long as it's clear in the plan and there's a cross-reference, that's fine. My, my concern was what approved actually meant and when, and that it didn't cause any delay. So if, as long as that's addressed, that's fine. Thank you. That's fine. Mr. Hayes. Oh, thank you. Yes, <clears throat> I was just reading up on uh, PPG on the on what it says about master plans, and um, it does talk about at the pre pre application stage. Um, so presumably, the application stage um, that the council is talking about wouldn't that would incorporate pre pre application stage as well, in terms of um, encouraging master planning done at the pre application stage. Um, <clears throat> but the other point I just wanted to make was uh, Mr. Russell's suggestion 
that uh, master plans would just be prepared by developers. I think, um, as it says in PPG, um, it should be a collaborative approach between local, the LPA site promoters and local communities. Uh, so it's not just the developer site promoter, but there's a number of parties coming together to influence and develop a master plan. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Mr. Millard? Yeah, it was only just to confirm, I'm very comfortable with Mr. Russell's suggestion about the inclusion of the wording in the glossary. Thank you. So, Mr. Russell, are you content to um, to fashion some wording, taking on board some of the suggestions that have been made or um, what you've just heard now? To yes, so indeed. Yeah. Glossary? We will make that. We will, we, we will make a change to make it clear that the determination of the of the of the master plan stroke development brief is at the planning application stage. Obviously, Mr. Hayes comments that you know you have the PPG, which encourages at the pre-application stage, and uh, absolutely that um, that uh, development briefs, master plans need to be a collaborative process. But ultimately, in terms of in terms of a decision maker, they they need to be submitted as part of a planning application and then determined by the relevant decision maker. So I don't think that having spelling it out in detail about pre app process is necessary in terms of the the plan. Um, I just wanted to go back. I, uh, sorry, I, I, I responded and then uh, we got into the the issue of. of of some wording changes. I didn't respond to Mr. Dank's point about um, where you've got a site with in multiple ownership and or multiple uh, promotion and how you would deal with a master plan in that situation. I think um, from our perspective, the, the policies have been written um, in terms of the obviously the policy that applies to the whole of the to whole of the allocation. So um, I, I pick one at random here, um, land at Wadden, um, development brief incorporating indicative master plan to be approved by the district council will detail the way in which the land use and infrastructure will be developed in an integrated and coordinated manner. Now that relates to the whole of the site, that relates to the whole of the allocation. Now how that is, how that is um, delivered through planning applications is not a matter that I believe the local plan should be explicit about. Again, it's about flexibility, how, how a promoter determines that a land is developed in a comprehensive and um, integrated uh, and coordinated manner is, is essentially a development management stage. Um, it's, not, it's not something we, we, we certainly don't intend to put into the local plan, you know, a requirement for you know, outline reserve matters on all of the site or, or get into the detail of of how a allocation will be delivered. Um, that that I believe is not is not a, a, a matter for the strategic plan. And I hope that that gives flexibility and to to um, site promoters, whether they're small or large or complex sites, to to determine the appropriate strategy, having regard to the fact that the policy does specifically state that it should be coordinated and integrated. Um, I think that's as far as we need to go in terms of the, the actual development plan itself. Thank you. Um, thank you. The, the comments made about what is comprehensive master planning, because that's in some, um, I can't remember how many, is that just in one? That was... If I can help, I think it's um, the the was that policy. Was just one allocation? Sorry. Yes, I think the policy for Hunts Grove, which uh, as you as you okay. is a carryover from the adopted plan, um, that does refer to that comprehensive master planning approach. And again, I would I would suggest that 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 is you know what it says on the tin. It, you need to produce a master plan that's comprehensive in the in the context of the of the allocation as a whole, not. Not to um, not uh, not to simply produce a I don't know if a site were chunked up into very small sites and then to produce a master plan for only your part of the allocation we would expect a comprehensive approach and indeed that's that's precisely how we how we managed the process with Hunts Grove initially there was a comprehensive master plan for the whole of the 
the allocation and uh, the same with Wester Stonehouse, etc. Uh, there, subsequently, there there will par parcels will come forward through uh, the development management process through SIP, uh, for more detailed standalone in some cases planning applications. But it's all under an umbrella of a, a comprehensive master plan, which was submitted at, at an early stage, um, whether it's an outline stage or whether it's a hybrid application with a with a associated master plan, but you know that that's fairly standard i would i would suggest thank you mr danks and then i'll bring in mr hurst thank you ma'am and uh, sorry to pro prolong the debate slightly um as mr russell was saying he referenced comprehensive and then went on to explain it and that explanation is the critical bit ma'am comprehensive could mean deal with a whole series of issues not necessarily an entirety of a site. And it's, I think where I was getting to is the maybe it's a reference to whole site. That's what's meant by comprehensive. Um, so, so that was the first point, ma'am. It's, it's a minor but very important point. Um, the second thing was just to come back to this when you approve a master plan or when you submit a master plan. Um, and again, I think in many circumstances it will work having a master plan, a comprehensive or a, a master plan associated with a planning application. But of course, the planning application has a red line and you're determining what's in the red line. That's what the local planning authority's function is. Um, and if you've got land outside of that red line, are, are you also approving that? Uh, if that's part of the master plan, which is associated with it. So it's, you get into slightly blurred uh, discussion there maybe i just think it might be easier perhaps it's about submitting uh at least submitting a master plan for the whole but whether you can approve it then as part of a planning application i'm not certain you what would you be as a, as a third party landowner would you be you'd be um uh, a consultee um to that application and that application might did otherwise seeking to determine what's happening on your land if a master plan is approved over your land. So I think it's just, it's not quite as clear cut in, in that sense. So the, the, the aspect that you're concerned about is that you, as you said, um, the allocation may well just show a certain area of land. There's additional land that um, a, a master plan is looking at or that a developer or land promoter whatever is looking at a wider area and wants to master plan the entirety of that because it's more comprehensive etc um but the master plan can't be approved by the council or how will the council deal with that because the master plan goes beyond the red line that's set out in terms of the allocation is that what you mean no not not quite mum similar so let, let, let's take, I don't know, let's take Sharpness, for example. Um, sorry, Mr. Fong, but Sharpness is a large site. Let's say Mr. Fong decides to make a planning application for half of Sharpness, the allocation, the proposed allocation, and that's his first phase, rather than making an application over the entirety. But at the same time, submits a master plan for the entirety of the scheme but I expect that to be approved oh, okay. as part of that planning mean. application. The planning application can't cover the other half because you're not asking the council to determine the bit outside the red line, but it is within the allocation. So all of a sudden you've got this, um, you've got a master plan which can't quite be comprehensive and can't quite be approved. So this is why quite often my master plans are approved in their, it, it, on their own where you've got either multiple ownerships or multiple applications within an allocation. That's why you have a master plan. It's for consistency. Otherwise, you just make a planning application. And as part of that, you've got design and access statement, covers the whole site. Um, and that's that would be the normal approach. That would include a master plan. So it's a slightly nuanced position. And I'm just not clear whether that's clear in the policy or not. OK. Well, I'm going to go to the council for that. I will come back, come back to Mr. Hurst in a moment because I know you're waiting in the wings. Council, can you, um, Mr. Russell, any comments you want to make on what Mr. Danks has just said on how the council would deal with that? 
Well, I, I think I've got uh, two points. Firstly, that the wording refers to indicative master plan, so it doesn't. It's it's not it's not at, at that stage where it's submitted and um, considered as as part of a planning application. It's not nailing it down uh, precisely, but it is indicative. And I would imagine that an indic indicative master plan for the whole of a site, which was subject to many clauses in the in the local plan would be would be an appropriate approach even if not all of the land was necessarily subject to a particular planning application my second point is more prosaic really what would mr danks suggest to address this issue in terms of the the plan in front of him what what's the i mean is it is it he, he's objecting to the addition as we just talked about about approving a master plan at the planning application stage because obviously that's not in the plan currently so is is that the objection to adding those words or is is it the words in the count in the policies to be approved by the district council I mean, it doesn't say for example that currently that, that that's approved at a particular point by the district council. I mean, it could be that it's approved and then amended and approved again um, a number of times through through the history of a, a site being subject to many planning applications. So I'm just trying to, under, I'm genuinely trying to be constructive here. I just, I just want to kind of understand how we can address Mr. Dank's point without um, well, yeah, just in terms of the what 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 precisely is the clarity he's he's looking for in terms of the words in the policies in in our plan? Because I understand the point is made generally. I think that's a, it's a valid point. But uh, what is it about our plan which needs amendment to address the point he's he's raising? Thank you, Mr. Danks. Thank you, Matt. Just to deal with the first point about their indicative master plans. What then happens is as a planning permission is issued and I, I can present them uh, a, a planning permission for Hunts Grove, that becomes an in strict accordance with the master plan as a planning condition, which then changes the emphasis of what a master plan is. So that's how they're used in Stroud. Um, so we you know, need to be mindful of that. And I um, absolutely understand Mr. Russell's point. It, it starts indicative, but then it becomes something else. So we just need to be clear. In terms of how we deal with it, I think it's quite straightforward. Um, if you're making a planning application over the entirety of an allocation, I think it absolutely can be determined as part of the planning application because the two are consistent. If your planning application isn't for the entirety of an allocation, then I think the master plan should probably be determined, approved prior to the first or alongside the first planning application um, and I think that's the nuance um, I think needs to be inputted into the, that description probably in the appendix um, in the glossary. But if the council's putting forward some wording to say that it will be approved as, as part of the planning application process doesn't that leave it open enough or flexible enough to allow that process to occur? Why, why does it need to say any more? Because that actually does, that does allow the council to approve a, a master plan for the entire site, but then but the planning application is only for half the site or a quarter of the site or whatever it is. Yeah, I, I is, that, say, is, that, is that enough? Or, or? But that, that's the subtlety in the wording there, ma'am, um, which, um, you know, we, we've been working with a garden community, uh, a garden village, and that's exactly what was done. Um, the approved alongside or with a planning application is absolutely fine. I think it, when it, when it, it's when it becomes approved as part of a planning application. And I know that's really subtle, ma'am, but that's quite... So it's important. alongside rather than as part of? Because otherwise you're you're seeking a planning permission. It's not forming part of the planning application, but it's running running in tandem with. Yeah. 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 And I think that, that would be very helpful. Council? Mr. Russell, any any issues with that? Or do you want to go I away think... and take away that wording? Well, I, I I would like to get obviously 
we, we've had a number of other parties <laughs> commenting on as part of the planning application process. We've had Mr. Dank saying it should be alongside. I, I would like to, if possible, get the, the views of other developer interests in the room. Um, I'm not to go away and draft some wording if if half the people in the room are going to come back and say, you know, that's not that's no, and I, that's I, not I, the right way forward. So if we could, if we could at this session in five, 10 minutes develop some consensus, then that would that would help me. Thank you. So anybody else got any comments on this particular point? So does it need to be as part of the planning application, the approval? or alongside or with the planning application? Is there a consensus in the room about which way the council uh, could helpfully go on this? I've got a couple of hands up. I know, Mr. Hurst, I will come to you. I just want to try and get this, this point sorted. So just be aware I am aware you're there. Uh, Mr. Millard, and then I'll come to Mr. Flanagan. Yep, thank you. Um, I guess Mr. Danks and I come at it from slightly different angles. Uh, our primary concern was that the outside of the termination of planning applications, the the risk to delay of the approval and ultimately the build out of a scheme was our primary concern, um, particularly relating to the sites which we're promoting on behalf of Persimmon Homes. But um, perhaps it's maybe some suggested wording as part of the planning application process rather than the decision because the process is more open-ended not and it's not just about the decision of a planning application it's part of the planning application the planning process sorry so i don't know if that adds a bit more flexibility without it being overly prescriptive and not trying to respond to every potential scenario which i understand why mr danks is presenting it and it's yeah. an important point but we can't caveat everything to result for, for every single potential scenario. So then that leaves, if that wording was used, that leaves the council the flexibility to approve as part of the planning application where necessary or alongside the planning application because it's still part of the process but not doesn't form part of the approval, if you get my drift. Okay. Uh, Mr. Flanagan. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, I'm not sure we're going to get a one size fits all on this particular no, issue. There, there will be a, a development management process to go through. I think the, the objective in terms of what the master plan is trying to, to achieve, and it will vary across site where you've got multiple ownerships or a single ownership, where you've got phasing of development, etc. Mm -hmm. And and really the, the master plan, I think what the council is seeking to do is to make sure that the, the, the policy influences discussions to take place between developers and landowners, make sure they come forward with comprehensive master planning. And I think the policy is effective in, in, in you know, as a principle, having that there. Um, and then also giving confidence to the council, then if there's a, if it's coming through in development management terms on a phased basis, that then there's a master plan in the background, which demonstrates that a comprehensive approach to green infrastructure, so on and so forth, has taken place. And the first phase of development is not prejudicing subsequent phases. So it's, it's how the jigsaw all comes together, really. So again, I think that the, the objective there is, is a good one and, and, and is effective. So I can see what we're trying to get at. But I do, I do take the point as well, having it's, it's, it's what the approval means um, and whether that gives flexibility. Um, with the, to give an example on the G2 site, um, talking the policy there is about development brief and there'd be a master plan within the development brief. And then you could see how there would be planning conditions that, you know, each phase of development, if there's an outline consent, for example, there could be a condition, say, each phase of development should demonstrate how it accords with development brief. So, and there's a mass plan. So you can see how that could work quite effectively. But then on some of the other allocations, there's not the requirement for a brief. And obviously a brief would relate to the bigger sites as well. So, yeah. You, um, I don't. I don't see a um, simple solution for all that. That's, not, that's, not, that's not very helpful, is it? <laughs> so, um, to finish your point, then. So, your take on it, then, 
I'll be going back to what the plan actually says and whether that's efficient, uh, effective enough. It's, I think it's whether it's a, it's an absolute policy requirement for the master plan to be approved. I think for a master plan to be prepared is one thing, and then for it to be approved, maybe, maybe that's the that's the tricky hurdle um, as a policy requirement because then it becomes an approved plan, and then if the, the that perhaps doesn't give the flexibility, etc. But I can see. <laughs> how it can be managed in development management terms with conditions and that we're, you know you you, you could um there certainly be conditions to work that through um but it's whether the, the policy presents a, a, a challenge then by by requiring an approval at this stage okay thank you um i'm going to come back to mr danks then i'm going to go down my list again because i've got a couple of people who want to speak mr danks just just to try and be helpful, I think you, you mentioned the as part of the planning application process, um, and that does give you flexibility to do a number of things, seek an approval via the planning application because it's comprehensive. Seek approval through a development management committee, which is quite often what happens with larger strategic sites at the same time as a planning application is determined or immediately before. Or it also allows you to prepare a master plan for the council to decide. It doesn't need to take it to a planning committee, but it's there's got some consistency for that wider development. And it illustrates that uh, there's been comprehensive consultation and a comprehensive approach. So I think your, your wording part of the planning application process. Oh, I won't take credit for that wording. <laughs> that Wherever it came from. Um, oh, I often that, that that does cover the multitude with a level of flexibility. I think that was Mr. Millard, wasn't it? I think we need to give credit to Mr. Millard for that, but um, oh. I think it was anyway. But um, yeah, okay. Thank you for your your comments on that. Um, Ms. Hamilton Foyne, please. Yeah, I think, ma'am, the, the, the issue is the word approval. And I think uh, I would agree with Mr. Millard's suggestion that part of the planning application process that gives flexibility. Okay. Really the word Thank approval. you. Thank Mr. you. Fong. Uh, Mom, I'm perfectly happy with the wording as it is, to be honest with you. We've got um, three of the large strategic allocations going forward. Um, you can imagine that we've already prepared master plans just to uh, demonstrate to the council and Mr. Russell's team that the, the whole site is deliverable anyhow. Um, it's going to come out through various iterations of the planning application in any event. Um, I think it's a matter for the decision maker to really decide on that master plan and it's a matter for the developer um, really to uh, put forward the, the, the best master plan he can. It doesn't mean that that is the final master plan. If there are alterations to be done to that during the application or otherwise, I'm sure the council will accept further master plans over and above the original. So I'm, I'm not seeing a massive problem with the wording as it currently stands. Uh, thank you. Do you see any concerns from your perspective if the council amended the glossary in relation to master planning the no, uh, it, it would always be helpful to have the, the wording glossary. In the, yeah, yeah. Uh, si simply because you know our dm uh, colleagues will 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 look at the glossary and it'll help them and guide them thank you i'll come back to the council then um thank you um has that helped or has that hindered? <laughs> uh, I think it helped. I think it's helped. Um, uh, I, I note, um, yes, Mr. Millard, thank you for that. So approved as part of the planning application process. I think Mr. Danks uh, uh, summarised his concerns as uh, that, that 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 wording would be flexible. Um, that, that that allowed flexibility in terms of. Uh, when exactly the development brief was prepared um, as part of that process rather than a specific planning application. So I, I would, my, my my proposal would be to not to amend any of these site-specific site policies, but to amend the development brief and master plan definitions in the glossary by adding uh, to be approved as part of the planning application process. Um, if you can add that to the list of potential MMs and um, yeah. people will 
have time to have a look at that. And obviously, um, uh, if we get to the MM process, then everybody will have a chance to have a say on any wording that's put forward anyway. So thank you for that. It's just nice to be able to bottom out some potential wording changes when everybody's in the room um, uh, because it's just easier in that way rather than Mr. Russell spending time changing wording and then everybody's unhappy with that. So thank you very much for your contributions on that. That was really helpful. Mr. Hurst, please. You've been waiting very patiently, Mr. Hurst. So. Thank you, ma'am. And um, I wasn't going to take part in this part of the conversations this afternoon, but I'm prompted to do so by some of the comments and uh, that have come forward. For the room, for the benefit of the room, uh, my background is 50 years as a chartered architect significant experience in the house building sector and I absolutely believe in the value of master plans I think you have to have an overview in order to uh, establish detail it's the, it is the fundamental skeleton upon which everything else is built um, having said that and uh, now into the elephant in the room stuff judging on results from uh, past schemes the standard model which is put forward by developers um, generally produces um, very ordinary almost mundane mediocre estates primarily because they are driven by uh, standard house types and um, <coughs> market expectations and it seems to me that if the master plan goes forward it should be um, perhaps infused with a bit more imagination as to the end product. Um, I know that there is a reluctance uh, amongst local planning authorities, Stroud in particular, to um, uh, resist developments um, which perhaps try to do something different. And there's always that fear of um, expensive appeal decisions going against the council down the line. So. Uh, what we end up with is mediocrity. And I just think it's such a shame and a lost opportunity. And I, as I say, I wasn't going to participate in this, but if the master plan process can do anything, I think it should be um, used to try and achieve something better than we, we conventionally are expected to accept. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurst. Thank you. Um, Council, anything, any comments you want to make? I think not in detail, but I, I, I recognise Nick's frustrations. I think nationally there's been a lot recently in policy and guidance around good design, whether it's design codes or uh, other um, other guidance produced at a national level. And uh, in, in fact, very recently, appeal decision, there are some significant appeal decisions where uh, design has, has been a, a focus of, of the Secretary of State uh, in terms of um, ensuring that good quality design is reflective of local character and distinctiveness. Uh, I, I would just say that I believe through a variety of policies in the local plan, we do, we do make the point about good design, whether it's in terms of design generally or layout or um, specifics around local character. I think I think there are sufficient hooks, should we say, within the policy for us to, uh, within the plan for um, the development management colleagues to, um, to resist poor development uh, and poor design. So, so I think that is an area that the government and, um, and all parties within the development industry have started to develop um, more sensitivity in terms of local character and distinctiveness. So, uh, but obviously, as as we all know, uh, it takes a long time for for that for that um, to feed through into developments in on the ground. And many developments that people are seeing now were planned for many many generations ago, or certainly a generation ago, maybe possibly more generations um, in the past. So, so I think it will take some time for really good design to come through the system. But I think the building blocks are there in policy, national and local. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hurst, your hand's still up. Is that for a new comment? Uh, it, it, yes, it, I, I've, in my um, uh, speech, my um, pontification, I forgot to make the point that I wanted to, which is that the 
uh, pre-apps discussion process between the council and developers <coughs> by and large takes place without um, uh, formal planning applications going out and it's only at that point at which uh, parish councils specifically get a chance to look at what is being put in front of them for decision and because <coughs> um, parish councils by and large are um, optional uh, by as we see it uh, not in stride it has to be said um, optional consultees and uh, it would be useful if in some way parish councils were involved in that pre-application process thank you thank you that's something for you to discuss outside the limits of this local plan unfortunately that's uh, that's a development management issue but by all means i'm sure the council would um would be happy to discuss that matter further with you outside the uh, the local plan process so thank you for that um anything further on question 13 does a master planning and development briefs no okay well the council's going to come up with some wording changes to the glossary um so we'll see what that wording is going to be when it comes forward. Uh, in relation to the other questions, 40, well, it's 14 and 15, 16 was requested the council to produce a trajectory. So it's not really a question, it was just a requirement that we asked for. Um, so questions 14 and 15, we're going to be discussing those as part of the um, site allocations. So I'm not proposing to have a discussion now. Uh, Mr Partridge? Uh, thank you, ma'am. Um, just on question 15, and it's not site specific, but <clears throat> it was mentioned this morning that <coughs> excuse me, the strategic threshold for employment sites was five hectares. I was wondering if you can ask uh, through yourself, ma'am, what the justification was for setting five hectares as a, a, a threshold for strategic employment land? Council? Uh, we, we haven't set a threshold. We simply identified some sites where we um, believe employment would be um, beneficial to the development and beneficial to the, the needs of the area. We haven't, we haven't set a threshold anywhere in terms of, in terms of uh, unless, unless you can point me to where we've specifically said that in the plan, uh, we've simply identified a series of sites where um, a proportion of employment is considered mm. good planning. Thank you. Well, that was that was my point. I I believed at the start of today's session that that was what was said. Um, I think we were talking possibly talking about Brinscombe um, containing employment, um, but not being identified. Uh, it was said that five hectares. Uh, represented the threshold for strategic sites. No, no, I didn't say that. I said that um, that where we where we where we considered that um, employment sites met the st the strategic needs of the district in, in terms of employment, we quantify it in the plan. So we've set out a quant a quantum of employment for those for those employment sites that we consider are important to develop our strategic economic needs. Other sites have reference in certain in certain places to the requirement for employment, but we haven't identified a quantum. But I don't I don't recall ever saying that there was a threshold. If I use the word threshold, then then that was a wrong term. Uh, we haven't we haven't determined a threshold. We simply identified the sites where we believe employment makes a strategic contribution to 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 meet our needs. Okay. Well, it, 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 it'll be on the recording. I can, I, can, I can check, but that was my understanding. But so I just wanted to know why, as I say, some some sites um, are included in the uh, as, as strategic sites, and others aren't, and what the what the cutoff was. But if if there isn't any, that's that's fine. That's the answer. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Partridge. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Partridge. Um, on that basis, then, um, if there's nothing further that anybody wishes to comment on, on this session on 6A, 
No, no more hands up. Good. Um, now I'd like to draw it to a close. So thank you very much, everybody, for your contributions. We have um, Stroud Valley tomorrow. So we'll be going through the site allocations for that. So uh, I will see um, those who are attending that session tomorrow morning at 9.30. So thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you.